Airleaf, we have Mark Durkin, we have Kelly Armstrong, the Vice Chair, Sinead Ennis, Karen Mullen, Alex Eason, and Fra has gone into the audience. Can I ask that Fra be brought into the spotlight, please? And welcome back to Fra. Um, <coughs> There we are. You're back in again, Fra. So we're, we're live at the moment, just to remind members, so we can hear everything that's going on. Um, so we'll go to it, item agenda one, which is apologies. I don't have any apologies. We all are present and correct, I think, today. Um, then I'll move on to agenda item two, which is chairperson's business. Members, a letter from the chairperson's liaison group in relation to the executive's decision to allow a condensed committee stage of the damages return on investment bill is, bill is at page five. Can I ask members, have they any comments on this? Or content to note? Any comments, content? Silence. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, members, then I just want to raise another issue with you. Um, due to the timings of the Easter re recess, um, this covers the two Thursdays of the 1st and the 8th of April. So I'm just going to suggest to you, depending on the progress of, progress of the licensing bill deliberations today and next week, would members be in agreement to hold a meeting on the 1st of April if needed? Um, now, the final decision on that can be made next week. But it's just if we, uh, you know, we, we got through quite a lot of business last week, which was great. So we're slightly ahead of ourselves. But just if members um, thought it might be useful, we could get things cleared up then on the 1st of April. And that means um, that would be then the clause by clause, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would, yeah. Um, possibly might need it after. Yeah. OK. So it's just to ask members' opinion on that. We can make the decision next week. But if we need to start making some plans on that. Yeah. 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 Okay, any other members had anything to say? Happy enough with it? With it, we get the committee staff to look at that? Yeah. Good stuff, okay. All right, then I'll move on to agenda item three, which is draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes for the 11th of March 2021 at page 12 of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are they content with the minutes as drafted? Yes. Good stuff, thank you. Then I'll move then on to Agenda item four, which is matters arising. Members, you've been provided at page 28 with a reply from the Minister for Health on the HSC staff recognition payment. He says that work is ongoing to finalise the scope and eligibility for the scheme for paid workers in the community and voluntary sector within the independent sector health and social care provider organize, and health and social care provider organisations. Officials have identified the need to collaborate with colleagues in the Department for Communities in regard to those employed within the community and voluntary sector. Are members content to note that or any comment? Content? I don't know. There's a little bit of background noise, if I could just say to my... Uh, I know it's coming from our, our, our folks on Starlife, so just be aware we can hear every shuffle of paper that's going on. That's slightly better. Any comment on, on page 28 of your meeting pack? Can members hear me okay? It's very low. It's very low, okay. Well, Jenny, I'll try and I'll shout a little bit because you are all looking at me a little bit lost there. Just um, pretend you're at home. I know. Sure. Go ahead, um, Kelly. No, no, sorry, it's okay. No, I think that's that's, um, that's fine. It's it's still going on that page twenty. <laughs> okay. So are members content then with the, the letter under matters arising at page 28, yes? Mm -hmm. Good, okay. Yeah. All right, members. We'll move on then to page 29, where you'll see a departmental response, or sorry, you'll see a response from RNID following the briefing by the Deaf Campaign Group on the video replay service. The RNID states that it supports the Deaf Campaign's group calling for a, re a region-wide universal video replay service across all public services as exists in Scotland. At a meeting with the Minister for Communities last year, the RNID was assured that a similar bill for Northern Ireland was in process and will be introduced to the Assembly during this mandate. 
Um, the PSNI currently offer access to non-emergency inquiries for deaf people through a text phone service and next generation text and for emergencies <clears throat> through an SMS service. Advice NI has, fund has funding to ensure advice services are accessible and that a communications plan was created jointly with the British Deaf Association to promote that service to deaf people, and the access to work service remains open and is welcoming applications for support from deaf people. The RNID agrees that the access to work budget needs to be increased to ensure more people can benefit from it, from it and that the department needs to undertake more promotion of the scheme to employers and deaf people. Overall, RNID has said it is supportive of the call for a universal VRS for Northern Ireland. Um, to enable access for deaf people to everyday services, which is their right. Members, any comment on page 29, or are they content to note? Kelly? Um, yes, Chair, this, this um, it just proves that we do need a sign language act. But the other thing about it is I would like us to write to um, the Department of the Economy to ask for clarification on the access to employment and the access to education. Um, I'm aware of a number of deaf people who have been refused support um, because they're undertaking um, postgraduate, um, not necessarily PhDs, but could be masters, and there's a disjoint um, where those people are not allowed to be funded, um, which makes a bit of a mockery of the system. Um, if we could possibly ask for clarification on the criteria for the access to employment, um, in particular, um, the, the issue with that is if you're having to pay out of that amount of money, excuse me, for uh, an interpreter, um, on a regular basis, and given the fact that the amount of time that would be needed, I would actually need access to a number of interpreters. The money isn't enough. Um, now, it just it just looks like that's that amount of money has been fixed for an extraordinary amount of time. Um, has there been a review on the level of funding that actually would be needed, and why is it not across both access to employment and access to education? You know that that review has taken place and the increase made. Okay, that's fair enough, Kelly. Robin, you wanted to come in. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, I have to say, I, I'm surprised at what Kelly has said because my experience is contrary uh, to to that. Uh, and I would like to see the correspondence uh, that that comes back. But uh, it wasn't really about that. The chair it was uh, a note in the uh, correspondence that the RNID has indicated that the Deaf Hub uh, feasibility study is being carried out by the department. Um, and I'd be quite keen to see that uh, we're, by yourself, Chair, kept up to date on the progress of that. Well, we can certainly ask yeah. um, the Department on progress. Members content with those proposals? Um, happy enough with those proposals, yes? Yeah. All right. Okay, then, members, I'll ask if you'd move on then to page 33 of your pack, where there's a response from um, NMNI on the relocation of the Model Engineer Society. Um, the period of notice to leave this site is being extended to enable the society to finalise their arrangements. NMNI is also facilitating the move by not pursuing the society's legal obligation to clear the site and make it good. And finally, NMNI hopes to provide practical support for re relocation as part of its walled garden project, although its plans to clear the the re and repurpose the site are subject to the established public sector business case justification process and DFC approval for the spend. Um, that's rather disappointing, I think, for the model engineers, that response. Um, I know certainly whenever we had them in front of us in committee, it, I was led to believe, and other members can correct me if I'm wrong, that there would be some sort of financial help. Um, but it seems to be now that it's all very dependent on whether DFC approved their business case for this walled garden. And if that's not approved, why were they being asked in the first place without that approval? Um, so it flow, throws up some more questions. Kelly, you have your hand up. Um, yes, Chair. I, to be honest, I'm in the same vein as yourself. I was under the impression if it wasn't financial help that there would be actually um, transport, you know, some sort of solution provided there to remove um, the model engineers from that site. Um, 
we're talking thousands and thousands of pounds because this is trains that have to be lifted um, track. There's a workshop there. Um, so I don't exactly know how um, NMNI are proposing that this group, who could only raise funds through donations, uh, move off their site then. Um, I think I would like NMNI to explain why they um, have changed what they appeared to have said to the committee when they met with us. And I know having spoken to um, the model engineers, to be honest, may as well leave all their equipment there and walk away now because um, how in the name of goodness, a voluntary group that doesn't even have charitable status, so it cannot apply for other funding, um, that was only allowed to collect donations um, from the site is supposed to pay upwards. I think I heard one of the, the members mentioning something around the cost of £20,000. Um, if the museums and galleries um, are now saying that they're not helping to move, actually move them off the site, that's not what they told us. And not taking legal action is a bit rich. That wasn't mentioned um, whenever they came to the committee. So I think I would like a letter to go back and ask them to clarify why they have now changed position and um, will they now come back and confirm they're bound to have trucks um, access to people who can move um, items given the fact that it's a transport museum. Um, so if we could get more clarification from them, I'm extremely disappointed by this response. And I have to say that um, Catherine Thompson and the, the people who, who came along with her that day to meet with us did not make it clear that it would be up to the group to remove um, and pay for such an expensive um, removal from site, particularly now when they're saying that DFC have not provided um, a clear business case or have not approved the business case. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with you, Kelly. I was very disappointed by this response. Alex, I know you want to come in on this. Yeah, just um, totally agree with everything that Kelly said. Um, I think um, if we could write to um, 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 and I, I can't get words, <laughs> um, expressing concern about what they're saying and what they actually did say. Um, and I was wondering, is it possible if we could write to the department about this as well? Um, I'm just really disappointed the way the engineers have, have been treated over this thing and this just adds to it and in my mind it just demonstrates everything that the engineers said has been totally true the way they've been treated and I'm just just totally offended the way this has all happened to them so if, if we could write to maybe the, the department and MM, MNI I, I would really appreciate that. Okay, it is a little bit of a tongue twister to say NMNI. Um, but yes, members agree with those proposals um, to write back to NMNI and also to the department. Yes, happy enough with those proposals, yeah? Yes, please. Good stuff, thank you. All right, then we're going to move on and I'll ask you to turn to page 34 of your meeting pack um, where you'll see a letter in relation to the independent review panel for charity regulation. Um, the panel is eager to meet with the committee to brief on its intended, pro intended process and to hear its views on the key issues arising from the terms of reference and any other issues that the committee may want to raise. Um, it might... Uh, you may find it preferable, given that our meeting may well be in advance of the launch of the planned public stakeholder engagement process, um, for this to be in closed session. So would members uh, are content to agree for an oral briefing for a future meeting? Agreed. And it may well be, as it says, may well be in closed session, but we can decide that nearer the time. Agreed? Agreed. Good stuff. Yep. Agreed. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, members, can I ask you to turn to page 40, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to winter fuel payments. Um, DWP anticipates that all payments will be made by the 31st of March 21. It has apologised for these delays and advised the department that it has deployed additional resources, ensuring that the small numbers of customers who have not received a payment are reviewed as a matter of urgency and payments are issued. And it says it is not possible to provide information on the number of eligible customers who have yet to receive their winter fuel payment, but this is a high priority for the Minister and the Department is addressing the issues raised and will continue to do so to ensure that all queries are raised and resolved. Members content to note that or any comment? Content? Content, yeah. Okay. 
Then can I ask you then to turn to page 42, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to SR 202141, the private tenancies, coronavirus modifications regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The making of the SR was accompanied by a press release from the minister which was also tweeted by the department. The department has noted, also noted stakeholders such as the Landlords Association of Northern Ireland and housing rights of the, the proposal to extend the emergency period. The department will continue to seek to ensure that the regulations are publicised as widely as possible through media, social media and engagement with um, stakeholders. Um, are members happy enough uh, to note that response? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, members, then, can I ask you to turn to page 44 of your pack, where there's a departmental response in relation to, to plans to assist young people seeking employment. Um, the department's existing range of work preparation programmes remain available. These are the Advisor Discretion Fund, uh, which is resources of up to £300 for the purchase of goods or services to remove a barrier to employment. Um, then there's the Travel to Interview Scheme, which provides funding support within a 12-month period of up to £500 to cover travel costs to attend job interviews that clients may not ordinarily be able to afford. And the Work Experience Programme offers high-quality two to eight week work experience placement opportunities with the aim of helping to improve overall chances of moving towards or into sustained employment. Again, members, any comment on that? Or are they content to note? Kelly, Chair, go ahead. Can I ask if we could get a little bit more information about the work experience programme? Because um, what I'm hearing is that that's not actually happening at the moment because of COVID. Um, there, there's that high quality two to eight week work experience placement opportunities doesn't exist. Um, if we could maybe find out what is happening then, because um, employers that were getting ready for job start um, would be interested, but um, obviously at this time they're not being engaged with. I just wonder if there's an overlap there that anybody who'd shown an interest in job start that obviously that hasn't gone forward could be linked in with the work experience program. No, we can ask, certainly ask more information on that. Um, any other comments from members? Or content we move on? Content? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, then just to the last piece then under matters arising, and that's at page 46 of your meeting pack, where you'll see a departmental letter in relation to the public lending right scheme. Um, Minister Caroline Dynage has written to Minister Hargey to bring forward legislation under Section 31 of the Digital Economy Act 2017 to include Northern Ireland. The public lending right is a right provided by the Public Le Lending Right Act 1979 for authors to receive payment from a central fund in relation to loans of their books to the public by local library authorities in the UK and is a transferred matter in respect of Northern Ireland. The Minister is seeking the Committee's uh, members' support for this change, which will go some way to ensuring that the authors of, are remunerated fairly across all jurisdictions um, for access to their books. Members, are you content to note that um, piece of correspondence? Yes, please, yes. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm going to move then on to agenda item five, which is actually our, our correspondence members. The correspondence memo is at page 41 of your meeting pack. I just want to draw your attention to two items. Um, the first one is page 83, and this is a response to the consultation on the role and regulation of the private rented sector. Are members content to request a briefing for this at a future meeting? Agreed. Great, thank yeah. you. Okay, and then just another one I want to bring your attention. It's 109, which is a letter in support of the priority, prioritisation of the reopening of leisure when safe to do so. Um, can I ask members, are they content to forward the letter to the department uh, in, in support of this request? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to go to members. Anything members want to bring up under correspondence? Are they happy with the correspondence memo as drafted? Yeah. Happy the memo? Okay, thank you. Then I'm going to go straight into agenda item six, which is forward work programme. Members, um, at the meeting of the 25th of March 2021, which is next week, the committee will continue its deliberations on the licensing and registration of clubs bill. Um, any comment on the forward work programme? Nope. Okay. Then I'm going to move then on to agenda item seven, which is AOB. If members any other business they want to bring up? Go ahead, Andy. 
Sure, yeah. It's just in relation to the tackling paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime funding. <clears throat> I understand the programme board have met and agreed the departmental-led uh, funding and letters of offer have been sent to the sponsor departments. Uh, and specifically in relation to a matter we, we discussed at the committee there a number of weeks back in relation to women in community transformation. If a committee was in agreement to write to the department and better understand their thought process around this, as I understand that programme is due to a f formally come to an end at the end of the financial year. However, the current delivery partners are none the wiser as to the department's thinking moving forward. Funding has been provided to carry on that, that uh, strategic output on their B5, but um, the, as I say the current delivery partners aren't aware whether they will be extended whether there be a new tender process, etc. So it would be good to understand from the department, it's DFC, where, where we are with that. Yeah, because it seems to be that there's going to be now a huge gap um, in that, and it, it, it is very unfair for those delivery partners who have projects and who have many women who have been involved in this programme and not be able to continue that um, or not have the knowledge as to how they're going to continue that into the future. Um, no, absolutely 100% agree with that. Kelly, is this the same issue or a different issue? Same issue. I was just going to say the other day in the chamber, um, the first minister very kindly responded to questions, um, and it was that point that I raised that there's a number of organisations, particularly community and voluntary sector, who have not received their letters of offers yet. Now, this is not necessarily just DFC. Um, it's across a number of departments, and I appreciate that the budget is still being worked upon. But there's a lot of our community and voluntary sector organisations are not and have not got the confidence to find out exactly what's going on um with the result that um you know notices of redundancy are starting um and well to be honest some of them have been out for a while um so i think that it might be following on from what andy has said not just dfc on this program but it might be worthwhile to ask the executive um to clarify um of the community and voluntary sector organisations funded by each department, how many are still awaiting letters of offer? No, that's a good point. Yep, absolutely. I think we'd all agree to that as well. Any other comments? Mouts, go ahead, Andy. Sure, just, just I want to put on record as well that um, the organisations that I've engaged with, um, they've made it very clear to me, you know, yes, whilst they, they hope to know where they stand, it's about the women participating in the programme. You know, they're being repeatedly asked by the women, you know, where do we go beyond the 31st of March? And they're, all they're trying to do through their, their engagement with myself and other members is better understand what they can convey to the women as to will there be another delivery partner or um, will the programme continue on? I think it's important to, to highlight that. All they're looking as answers, which I believe they deserve, and thus far they haven't been forthcoming. Yeah, and I know that programme has been very worthwhile. Um, so it has for many women across all of Northern Ireland. Um, so, yeah, I think that is important that we do remember that also, that it's actually the, the people that actually take part in all of these programmes and the benefit um, from, from this money that goes through our community and voluntary sector. Mm. So, yeah, that's fair enough. So are members content with those proposals? Yes? Yes. Good stuff, OK. Any other business members want to bring up at this stage? It might be something later on in the meeting, and that's fair enough. But just if there's not, I'll move on. Yeah? Okay, then I'm going to move on then to agenda item eight, which is SL1, the housing benefit persons who have attained the qualifying age for state pension credit, Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this SL1 at page 114. The proposed rule will amend the housing benefit regulations Northern Ireland 20, 2006 to include new rates for housing benefit for those not subject to the transitional protection of the removal of the savings credit uplift. Are members content that the department proceed to make this rule? Yes? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Then I'll move on to agenda item nine, which is SR 2021-58, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factor Factors Order Northern Ireland 2021. Members should find a copy of this rule at page 118. Can I ask then if many any, any members any objections to the rule? No. no objections. Okay, then I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-58, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Order Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objections to the rule. 
Okay, then we'll move on to agenda item 10, which is SR 2021-59, the mesothelioma lump sum payments, conditions and amounts amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, members, you'll find a copy of this rule at page 129 of your meeting pack. Again, can I ask members, have they any objections to the rule? No. no objections. Okay, I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-59, the Mesothelioma Lump Sum Payments Conditions and Amounts Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 21, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Okay, then can I move on then to agenda item 11, which is SR 2021-60, the Occupational and, Pensions and Personal Pension Schemes General Levy. Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. Members, again, you'll find a copy of this rule at page 138 of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, have they any objections to this rule? No. No objections. Then I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-60, the Occupational and Personal Pension Schemes General Levy. Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Okay, I'll move on then to Agenda Item 12, which is SR 2021-64, the Social Security Claims and Payments Employment and Support Alliance PIP and UC Telephone and Video Assessment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this at page 150 of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, have they any objections to this rule? No objections? Okay, then I'll put the following. That the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-64, the Social Security Claims and Payments Employment and Support Alliance PIP and UC, Telephone and Video Assessment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, we're going to now move on to agenda item 13, which is... Just, sorry, sorry, Go sorry. ahead, Mark. Um, just on that, and it's page 156. And it was one thing, it's around amendment of the personal and the pensions payment regulations. And it says, the claimant may be called for consultation to determine whether the claimant has limited or severely limited ability to carry out activities. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I've misread that wrong. I was ju just going to be like, how were they going to be contacted? Because if someone was had difficulty <laughs> communicating over the phone, are they going to be contacted by, by phone or are they going to be called in in person? Um, I know we had, um, didn't we have a, an, a, 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 we had explanations around this last week. There was a bit of question and answer session around it last I, week. I, I, know, I know, I think it was Andy had asked. Yeah. You know, would someone have to do it by phone? But here, it's wondering how they determine whether or not someone can do it by phone. You can't use a phone to do that. Chair, um, this comes back to um, the claimant themselves um, being able to take and make that decision to um, decide whether or not it would be done just on paper, telephone or by video. Um, as Mark has said, um, I think... I'm hoping at some stage they'll expand the video to include other um, visual um, opportunities such as, as um, the video relay service. But it, it is up to the, the claimant to confirm that um, or their guardian or parent. Yeah, and I think that's what they said quite clearly last week, that it, it would be the choice of the claimant as to how they want to be contacted. Andy, did you yeah. want to come in? Yeah, Chair, sure. and, and just, just for a remark point, you know, they did make it clear they wouldn't put anybody under any undue pressure and I think I'd also ask that we could write to the department and make sure that that is clearly emphasised in the letter that is sent out um, in relation to inviting an individual for the work or the capability assessment so that they know they're under no um, pressure to attend that if they do not feel able to do so and that we're probably waiting on a response for that. So I would say we are still waiting on the response for that. Um, I know, I mean members, we've, the, the uh, the statutory rule has now been made by or has been passed by the committee following the, the, the deliberations last week on it. Um, I think yeah. we just have to keep an eye on this one because we know ourselves as constituency MLAs, the amount of people that come through our office when it comes to um, these issues. And um, sometimes uh, common sense is not shown 
um, by by the department and by advisors at times. Um, uh, you know, whenever we phone up um, on behalf of a of a of a claimant. Um, so I, I think there is an onus as well on the department just to make sure that their staff are made aware of this also, um, that that's ruled out that it is up to the claimant um, which form of, of correspondence they want to use. Are members content we move on from that? Yeah, sorry. No, you're all right. Okay, we're going to move then to agenda item 13, which is committee deliberations on the clauses of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, members, the committee will now continue... <laughs> I can't speak today. <laughs> the committee will now continue its deliberations on the the um, bill. Um, okay, members, you've been provided page one five nine with a note of the meeting that the committee held with young people to gain their views on the bill. Can I ask members are they content to note and include a copy of this paper in the committee's final report? Content? Yeah. Okay, yeah. members, you've also been provided at page 163 with a copy of an email from the representative of the Northern Ireland Brewery and Independent Pub Association and also the Society of Independent Brewers in relation to tap rooms. Um, members, I know we all will have read that and it was uh, reference um, responses we had had from the department last week around tap rooms and how that uh, this really was, they were saying that this wasn't brought up in 2016, when it was quite, quite clear that it was brought up in 2016 um, during evidence sessions. So are members content that we forward a copy of the email to the department for an urgent response? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other comment <laughs> on that or content for me to move on? Uh, members, the summaries of stakeholders' evidence documents, numbered 1 to 8, start at page 180. Um, we have Carol Isle... Carol... Blech, goodness, I don't know what's going on with me today. We have Carol Reid and Suzanne Breen from the department and uh, are in attendance this week, and also Claire McCanney from the Bill Office, who will be available uh, as of last week at the same at the end of the meeting for a closed session for the committee to have a, a more in-depth discussion around um, many or any amendments we might want to see. Can I remind members that this is a continuation of informal deliberations? Uh, we started last week and it's not the formal clause by clause stage. Um, members, today we will commence at clause 10. Are members in agreement with that? Agreed. Okay. Then can I ask then, oh, they're already in the audience, are in the spotlight. Um, Carol and Suzanne, you are both very welcome to the meeting um, this morning. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Yes, good morning. morning. Good stuff. Okay. Um, can I just then, sorry, ask Spotlight, can they bring all of the members into the, or, in, or can I ask Pi to bring all of the members into the spotlight again? It's just, it's, it just means then it's, uh, we can have a bit more of discussion. There we go, members. These are all in the spotlight, just to remind us of that, that we can hear everything going on um, in the background, wherever you are. Um, so, Suzanne, I'm going to ask you to give a brief overview uh, again on the clauses as we go along. So I'm going to go to the, the fifth set of clauses. Members, the fifth set of clauses will, uh, we will consider are those related to children and young people under the age of 18. They are clauses 10, 11, 12, 13, 26, 27, 28 and 29. So we're going to start then with clauses 10 and 26, um, which is the removal of requirement for a children's certificate. So Suzanne, can I ask you then to um, give us a brief overview on 10 and 26? Yes, no problem, Chair. These clauses remove the requirement for licensed premises and registered clubs to apply to the courts for a physical children's certificate. All the safeguards and conditions relating to under 18s and licensed premises and clubs remain the same. Okay, thanks, Suzanne. Okay, members, there was considerable support for this proposal to remove the need for a separate children's certificate, as the current system is bureaucratic and costly and can be replicated within the main liquor licence conditions, and the PSNI will not have to continually check if premises have a certificate in place. However, a number of submissions highlighted that it is vital that the safeguards are properly enforced and monitored, and that if the requirement for children's certificate is removed, all necessary provisions to prevent children should be built into a statutory code of practice. It was also highlighted that a number of key stakeholders that there should be no changes in the law 
um, that lead to rules around children in bars being relaxed as without appropriate restrictions, the risks of initiation into alcohol consumption and heavier drinking by young people are considerably increased, particularly through the wider rule model of drink, modelling of drinking, and also provisions to protect children in and around licensed premises are essential, as childhood and adolescence in particular is a critical um, development phase. Uh, members, any comments on that? I do remember, actually, and do note from the, the young people that we had um, that evening that were saying, actually, they would rather be able to be around their, their parents uh, and their relatives at whatever functions that might be and um, actually see responsible drinking rather than the first time they are they, they're, they're, they're out with friends or whatever at 18 in the city centre where they see actually quite unresponsible drinking or irresponsible drinking. Um, so the, the, they had certainly made lots of comments around the various issues that we're going to discuss in this set of clauses. Members, any comments? Kelly? Just to, to ask for clarification on what is meant by a responsible adult. Um, it, it sort of seems like it's blatantly obvious, obvious in common sense what a responsible adult is, but if we could just confirm what that does mean or where it's going to be defined. Um, Chair, I'll take this one. I'm just actually checking, is responsible adult, I'm just checking whether responsible adult is actually mentioned in the... Um, Sorry, maybe it's in weird. that clause, no, I don't. I don't, be, I don't believe it is now, but I can double check. Um, I mean, no, I think everybody agrees here that, that you know it's vital that children and young people are protected from the harms of alcohol. So, in this particular clause, the clause really repeals the articles that relate to the application process only for going for the children's certificate. So, all the protections, as Suzanne said, remain the same. All the articles in both orders that refer to you know the parts of the bar that a children that a child or young person can be in the time that they can be there for the fact that they have to be accompanied um, by somebody over the age of 18 i think is the terminology that's used um, you know that it's an offense to sell to it's an offense to allow consumption those sorts of things they are all remaining the same this is purely the process for going to court the price that they have to pay um, and the time that that takes it really is just cutting out the bureaucracy um, there's no question about the actual safeguards that, that apply Okay. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So it's just over 18s then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Members, any further comment on clause 20, 10 and 26? Or can help me move on? Okay. Then I want to go to clauses 11 and 27. Again, Suzanne, can I ask you for an overview on these? Yes, this clause is 11 and 27 relates to underage functions. These clauses, first of all, allow courts to make an order saying a part of a premises is suitable for an underage function. A court must be satisfied that the part of the premise is structurally adapted for the purpose of holding functions, that appropriate steps have been taken for securing the safety of under 18s, and that under 18s don't have access to other parts of the premises used for the sale of alcohol. Courts will then be able to make an authorization for a specific function. This order can specify the hours for the function, but they cannot go beyond 1 a.m. Alcohol dispensers must be out of operation and access to other alcohol must be prevented. Over 18s are not permitted to buy or consume alcohol at the function and no gaming machines are permitted. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Um, members, there was a support here from the hospitality and hotel sector generally that the legislation should be changed to allow young people um, under 18 into licensed premises to attend underage functions under the conditions specified. The current situation means that no function, whether a school formal or even a careers fair for teenagers can be held on licensed premises, even when the bar is completely closed. The clause was welcomed by the PSNI also, as these situations have been problematic for policing in the past. The hotel sector highlighted that the hotels offer a regulated and controlled environment for younger people and school formals, etc., are a valuable source of income for many properties, particularly over the winter months in rural areas. However, members on the other side of the coin, it was highlighted to us that, as with some other clauses, it furthers the norm of alcohol consumption and the norm that functions must be on licensed premises where alcohol is at the heart. The committee have been encouraged to reflect on the meanings of the term underage functions and that they should be children's events defined 
by their function to celebrate and not defined by <coughs> eligibility of alcohol consumption. Um, members, if the bill proceeds as drafted, certain specific concerns were raised with the committee. So measures should also be put in place to ensure that all aspects of safeguarding for under 18s are taken into account. Um, it was also queried as 1 a.m. an appropriate finishing time, particularly if there is no lower age limit set for functions, branded age-related closure times could be considered. And will children meet with adults dispersing from other parts of licensed premises? And then there was always also queries around 18th birthday parties, which could have potential to attract underage persons to a venue when the bar could be open. Now, some of those issues were issues that were brought up again by um, our young people. Um, so, just members, any further comments or any further questions they want to ask around this? Kelly? Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, we had a, a wonderful witness session with those young people who were, were quite frank and, uh, and took me back quite a few years to my own youth. Um, one of the things that came up, um, Siobhan and Carol, I would really love to know. So in these underage functions, and to be honest, I'm delighted that um, we would have formal you know, able to go back to one o'clock in the morning. So there's a couple of questions I have on this one. So we know that 18-year-olds um, who attend these functions, and there are people um, who are at school who are 18 um, in year up or sixth year 14, I think it is. Um, those young people um, can go into another area of a hotel or wherever this function may well be held um, to have alcohol. It's just that they won't be allowed to bring it back into that function room isn't that correct um and also i just want to check about the the drinking up time one of the concerns that we would have or i know that came up in the young people's discussion that i was at um is that while the event would be off over at one o'clock in the morning um there could be potential for those young people to be coming out at the same time as as other people who've been drinking um they didn't seem to be so concerned about that but they did want to have time where they could be collected with taxis or parents or whoever it is that they're they're getting lifts with um, I'm just double checking to make sure that we're we're definitely within this legislation enabling that safety to happen so that those young people can stay in premises for a short period after the one o'clock um, function end, or is it a case that actually they need to be gone by one o'clock? Kelly, it's actually it's actually a good question. The, the way it's defined at the minute is that the event has to be ended by by one a.m. I'd actually like to take that one away. Um, if you don't mind, the the drinking up time, yes, the drinking up time is for where alcohol is served. So it's allowing that person to remain on the premises and the license holder isn't committing an offence by allowing that consumption to take place outside the hours that they're allowed to sell. So I think, I think again, using the term common sense, you know, the event finishes at 1am, it will take time for those people to leave. So again, if, a, if the police arrive on the scene and everybody's sitting around tables, you know, still enjoying music and things like that, that would obviously be an issue. But if they're gathering their things together to actually leave to be collected, I don't think it would, but I would prefer to just double check with the drafts person in case we would need um, to put something in there. I mean, in terms of the, the it finishing at one, the if, if all the other changes in respect of permitted hours and drinking up time um, go through in the bill, you, you effectively have a sort of staggered you know, closing, stagger, kicking up, kicking out time anyway. You've got 11 p.m. for those that don't have late licenses. So they've got, you know, an hour's drinking up time. They'd be leaving at 12. You've got the the 1 a.m. The 1 a.m. then that they would have an hour's drinking up time. They're going to be leaving any time, sort of between half one and two, you would imagine. So realistically, the young people should be gone by then. Um, and that's if they all go through. In terms of the over 18s that potentially could be, so that could be, yes, an over 18 who is actually still at school and is attending the formal or is a, a guest of somebody attending the formal or even a chaperone who's there. Um, yes, they could go to another part, but it would actually be illegal to consume that alcohol where the event has taken place. And it would also be illegal for the license holder to allow that consumption. Um, so it would be the license holder's responsibility to make sure that that didn't happen. Can I just double check then, um, if, if uh, an 18 or over person was in that function room, uh, I say that there is an offence there, does the fine apply to those 18 year olds who could, you know, an adult basically, who is in that, that function area, is it just 
the fine would be against the the, the venue owner. It it would be against both, I believe. Um, yeah. So it's um, in terms of the clause there. So to permit a person aged eighteen or over to consume. So that's a person who contravenes Article Eight. Sorry, I'm just double checking this quickly. No, sorry. If you go to um, if you go to the new Article Fifty Eight B Ten. So a person aged 18 or over who consumes intoxicating liquor in a part of the premises um, is guilty of an offence and shall be liable. So it's both. Um, it would be the licence holder who allows it and the actual person that's over 18 who consumes it. I suppose that, that, that covers where potentially they would try to smuggle in um, something themselves to, to, to maybe hand over to the, um, to the young person that they're with. And again, that even, even in doing that, that, that's illegal in another part of the legislation as well in the current law. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I just add, there's no mention of preloading or um, not permitting people into um, the underage function um, who's drunk um, or, you know, I take it then there would be a, I don't see it here, I'm just maybe missing it, um, a search function is permitted then for those underage functions to make sure that somebody isn't bringing something in? Search functions would be a DOJ issue, I believe, um, in terms of physically searching somebody. I, I, that's not something that I don't believe would come under liquor licensing law, but again, I can double check for you. Um, I believe searches do take place now. They can take place. If that's a body search, I don't know. I'm just being honest. I actually, I actually don't know. Um, I mean, again, going back to the days whenever I would have been out and about, I know you would have opened your, you would have opened your bag, um, and shown that. And I, I, I imagine that that is perfectly legal then, because it does happen now. Um, in terms of the preloading, again, it's outside the remit of a licensing bill. Um, we have no control over what happens. It does happen now. Um, whenever you've got those licensed premises, you've got trained staff at the doors. So at least you have that. They have a duty of care to young people, um, you I'm, know, in, just, in any premises. Right. I'm just wondering, um, those underage functions, um, because it's connected to liquor licensing, so that, that should still be a protection there. So if, if banks are on the door, underage function, somebody's come along clearly drunk um, or having taken quite a lot of alcohol, um, then they can be denied access. I think that's that still would apply. So if you have somebody turned up at a, at a bar or anywhere, you know, where alcohol is being sold, they can be denied access or denied. Um, so they wouldn't get at an underage function, they wouldn't be served drink. But um, I'm just trying to think of the protection for children, um, that if they do preload and turn up because they can't buy drink there, um, that there will be something that you know they'll be denied access no absolutely and i think that that does happen now um and there are engagement between licensed premises the police um uh, the like of the sos bus in belfast and things like that and there are i think the belfast trust i've spoken to someone in the belfast trust in the past where where there are specific underage events they do generally work together with the councils and ensure that there is somebody there on site um, i mean we all know of issues that have happened in the past where young people have arrived um quite large numbers of young people have arrived and there's been um, incidents declared um, as a result. So in terms of the underage functions, again, the, the license holder has to go to the court um, twice. They have to go to the court to begin with to prove that the premises is actually suitable for an underage function. Um, and in doing that, the court will take into consideration what safeguards and how they are going to protect young people at that event. Um, and that would include people arriving at the door, I imagine, and that's for the court to decide. Then whenever they want an individual event so for each formal for each event they need to go back then to the magistrate's court um to apply for that um so i think you know the the, the safeguards are definitely there um and the the engagement i think that the, there wouldn't be any doubt that the premise is involved particularly in terms of the formals and the evidence that was heard from um, the hotels federation um everybody wants these events to take place in licensed premises in regulated environments where there are responsible adults um, they're, they're to assist if anybody does get themselves into any trouble. Yeah, well, I definitely would rather have them on a in a formal on a premises that's regulated than disappearing off to house parties at nine or ten at nine or half nine. Um, no, thank you very much. Thank you. And Kelly makes a point there. I know certainly young people that we spoke with had said actually this what what this could do is actually see a decrease in alcohol consumption because at, at the moment they do leave at nine o'clock. 
they all head off into local bars around their town or to someone's house um, and uh, have and, and do consume alcohol. They were very honest with us, which was great. Um, though some of them did say that um, actually it wouldn't stop them smuggling alcohol in, which will happen. They did say if young people want to drink alcohol, they'll drink it and no amount of legislation is going to stop it. Um, there were some rather initiative ways as well we were told about. Um, so, but there is a plus side here that it, it will discourage that leaving at nine o'clock. Um, so I, I think we need to remember that as well. So any other questions or comments on this? No? Happy we move on. Sure. Go ahead. I know we had, we had talked about it in one of the witness sessions. Um, I just want to check with the guys. Is there any overlap happening with DFI on the alcohol consumption on buses? So before young people actually get to this event, event um, they may well travel on a bus. And I know it may, it'll come up um, when we talk about private functions or major uh, major events. Um, it's that alcohol consumption on buses. Um, you know. We're saying here that young people, they may well have a drink in advance of, of a function. It's not the venue owner's responsibility. But if there's a package where the venue owner um, and a, a local bus operator or taxi firm are in, in connection about organising that function, is there anything there in this? Or do we just have to leave it to DVI or DFI, sorry? There's nothing in the liquor licensing legislation. And again, I think it comes down to actually the remit of the department and the scope of the bill. Um, the liquor licensing legislation relates specifically to licensed premises, and yeah, the the, the issue of the buses just they they, they aren't the, they they don't form a, a category of premises. Um, uh, the DFI would be the ones that would be in control of that legislation. Okay, so the the party buses and and those type of things wouldn't come under this. Then they they're not considered a venue. No, no, they're not a category of premises. Okay. I know, just to say, Kelly, there, I, there, I have transport is within my chair's brief as we get to, to later on in, the, uh, in our discussions here, <coughs> because there are several things that have been brought up that are not within the remit of this bill, but yet as a committee we might want to put them into our report, um, whether that is recommendations or whatever, so I, 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 it's not part of this bill, but the committee can certainly have them as part of their final report um, as to what other um, uh, ministers or other departments um, as recommendations from the committee following the bill. Um, so just to remind members of that, 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 that uh, option is there to do that. Um, any other questions around 11 and 23? Nope, we'll move on. Okay, we're going to go to clauses 12 and 28, which is private functions. Again, uh, Suzanne, if you want to go ahead. Yes, this will allow under 18s to remain on licensed premises beyond the current 930 restriction to attend a private function. Members of the public must not have access to the function. Persons under 18 must be in company of a parent or someone with parental or caring responsibility. At least a main course must be being served and that meal cannot be consumed on any counter being used as a bar. Okay, thank you for that. Um, members. These clauses have generally been seen by the hospitality, hotel and club sector as being a welcome development and reflective of changes in society and that it is important that young people are included in family events and that they have an opportunity to engage in social activity in a controlled and regulated environment. However, as with many of the other clauses, a number of specific issues have been raised with the committee. Um, issue around private functions should be clearly defined, such as a wedding, wedding anniversary, christen, christening or birthday party. I don't know if, um, if, if, if we're intent on being that specific within the bill. And if a party is more casual dining, is this suitable? The Federation of Clubs particularly had some concern over the provision of what constitutes a main meal. And I know that came up also with our young people who had said about maybe going to a family anniversary or a, a, a birthday party of grandparent, whatever that might be. It then puts the family under a greater pressure and a lot more financial pressure if there has to be a main meal served. I know certainly I've been to a few in my own family where it has been um, a, a buffet or it has been food actually that the family have brought along to a club um, in order to fulfil that. So I think there are a few <coughs> issues around that were raised, around cost. Um, so if it has to be a main meal, then there will be a certain uh, um, element with or amount of people within society that will not be able to afford that. Um, so that causes a bit of a problem. And then also the definition of has care of that person um, and it just should that be interpreted um, generously 
um, if an older child is there or an aunt or a grandparent. So as long as it's an adult over 18, um, is that what we're talking about, has care of that person? And then some concerns in relation to birthday parties and types of entertainment provided at parties, geared mostly at adults. Um, so you can all use your imagination for that one. And careful consideration regarding 18th birthday parties, which could have a potential to attract underage persons to a venue um, when the, the bar could be open. And also the responsibility for the protection of children from alcohol-related harm should lie with the operator in the case of all drinks being pur purchased by the family um, function host. So it's just there's a few questions there if Suzanne or Carol want to pick up on, um, especially around the meal issue. I think that was that certainly our young people recognise that, that that could pose a problem for their parents or their grandparents, um, that if they wanted to hold a, a, a anniversary party or a birthday party in, one of, in, in a social club or a hotel, um, that this, this main meal, what, what, why was the rationale for a main meal? Sorry, Chair, I'll pick up on those chairs as well. I've just realised I don't think you can see me. Um, I can't, Carol. But I, 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 do, I do, I'm sorry, I do have my camera on and it, I did try very quickly to see if I could fix it to see what's going on, but I, the heart's scared of being pushed out. So <laughs> um, if we have a break, I'll try again. Um, yeah. But yes, so in terms of in terms of the, the definition, and you're, you're, you're right, there's a concern there about a risk of being overly prescriptive. So that could lead to confusion if there are if there is a list there of what what is allowed and what isn't allowed. It could also rule out a significant family event in the future that nobody has ever thought of before. Yeah. Um, so that's why it, it was it was defined as just being you know private where there wasn't any access from from uh, that the public couldn't access it. So basically, you're talking about your family and friends as invited guests. Um, in terms of the what constitute a meal. Um, the definition there talks about a meal consisting of at least a main course is being served. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be you know, provided and paid for by, by the venue. Um, there, there is, I mean, there's, there's case law in terms of a main table meal where it's more than a simple snack, but we've stepped away from the main table meal and purposefully used the definition of the main course to allow for things like buffets. Um, and it doesn't at the have end to of be it. supplied by the, the, as you said, by the um, venue, because I, I know I've been to many of our family parties where uh, my my mum and my aunts have made lots and lots of things and brought them along. Um, is that well, accessible or is that acceptable? Not for my mother been... and my aunt to provide for everybody's party, <laughs> but uh, everybody else's mother and aunt. <laughs> The, the way it's drafted is that it's being served. Um, I'll actually I'll, I'll go back and check with the drafts person again on that one. Um, it could be that it's a it possibly be available rather than being served. Um, so we we can double check to make sure that that's covered. Um, but I think you know th there definitely needs to be the meal there. There definitely needs to be some sort of refreshment. Um, again, you're talking about having young people under the age of eighteen. In a licensed premises so you know realistically if it's only drinking that's happening beyond that 9 p.m you know there's a question there of is it actually suitable for them to be there no 100 um, agree with that you're i know agree with that yeah yeah and in terms of the the, the care of that person um it was drafted specifically for that uh, the drafts person had raised issues about actually using just the term parent and um, even the term parental responsibility um you know there's 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 so many different families and the, the how families are made up at the moment. Um, you know, and even down to you could have a parent who maybe works in the emergency services and had fully intended on going to their grandparents' birthday party or anniversary party and bring their child with them and then get called in to work um, at the end of, the, you know, late on in the day, which if you had have drafted it as specifically a parent would have meant that that young person missed out on that family function because their parent had to go to work. So. That, that wording was chosen very carefully, um, that it was care of that person. Um, it wouldn't be intended to mean just an over 18, um, which would then allow, you know, say a couple where one is 18 and one is 16 or 17. Um, it is that they would have care of that person. Um, in terms of, let me see, you talked about the types of entertainment provided at parties. Again, you know, they're private functions. There's no access by the public suggests as friends and family that level of parental responsibility you know there has to be a level of responsibility there that certain types of activities wouldn't be allowed if there was young people um 
the eighteen the eighteenth birthday parties um again has to be in the company of you know a parent or carer um, all the conditions all the offenses in respect of the sale of alcohol still apply so you know anybody that's there over the 18 is committing an offense if they try to um supply alcohol to that young person if they purchase it with the intention of supplying alcohol to that young person um and similarly there was mention about you know that the 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 responsibility should lie with the operator and it it always does that is you know there is a license holders have a serious responsibility whenever they take on a license whenever they're granted a license um and they have to be aware of all of the safeguards there in relation to having under 18s on their premises if they choose um if they choose to allow that they have to make sure that they follow that and there are um ramifications if they don't obviously there's offenses associated with it okay look thanks carl for that robin you wanted to come in yeah chair um being in the company of a parent and i would understand the points that are made being in the company doesn't necessarily mean that they are being supervised. But can I just ask, what, what would be wrong with the, the, the definition supervised by an adult family member? What, what would be wrong with that? Um, I, would need to, I would need to check with the draft person again. Whenever we're drafting, we, we, we specifically state what we want the law to allow and what we don't want the law to allow. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually don't know, but need to go double. I would need to double check mm -hmm. on that, um, chair. To be fair, I suppose you have you do have occasions where if it's a family <clears throat> event and you'll have a, a neighbour's or, or a you know a neighbour's child maybe yeah. turns up as well because they they know the family well, but they're not being supervised by their own parent. It's someone else's parent is supervising them. I suppose or, it's that whole being too prescriptive. I think yeah. that is the issue that we don't want to have um, to allow oh. for those sort of things to happen. I don't know. Sorry, Kelly, go oh, ahead. That's right. Sorry, no, it's the potentially as well for you know the, the supervision and in the company of some of the some of the, the areas, um function rooms and things like that and some of these premises could be quite large and you know, one parent's definition of supervising their child might be very different to another person's definition of supervising their child. So you know, in terms of actually having to be in their company, would, would it, um, I would suggest that they have they have sight of that person. Again, okay, I'll, I'll I'll double check and come back to come back to the committee if that's okay. Yeah. Sorry. Do you want to come back? Uh, uh, only, only the comment, sure. I would I would have thought that the the venue themselves would have uh, wanted to be assured that the under eighteen is in some degree of supervision. Um, and particularly if it is a large premises um, where <clears throat> it is not their responsibility, it's not the venue's responsibility to supervise the, the young under 18, but indeed to ensure that the young under 18 is supervised, um, then that's the responsibility of whoever is accepting the responsibility of uh, bringing the young person to the venue. Okay, Kelly, did you want to come in? Yeah, it's just a follow up on this one. How, I, I take um, Robin's point, although I, I don't think limiting it down to family, um, because then you have to prove blood ties. That's a whole other ball game. Um, I've, I've a daughter who's coming up on this age and will hopefully have an 18th birthday party at some stage after lockdown. Um, and all of her friends, while they're not blood relatives, um, they may as well be family. Certainly, if when when they were allowed, they treated this house certainly as if they were my son or daughter. Um, I'm just wondering, but how, we have it in education where there's a number of young people per adult. We're not saying this here. So you could have something like an 18th birthday party, and um, you have that that person's parents are perhaps there. Um, and there could be another two hundred people on, yeah. you know, under at that venue. How many adults per young person would be appropriate for supervision, or is that just being left vague? That isn't covered under the current draft. No. Okay. Okay. So you could technically you could have a private function, which is an eighteenth birthday party, where you've got adults and underage people there, um, and you could have one adult or one parent or the equivalent of a parent in that venue 
Well, the person in terms of the definition, the person under the age of eighteen has to be in the company of their of of their of their parent or carer. So I imagine in that case, if if the police arrived on the scene for for any reason and there was an event where there was one parent, okay, saying what that they had. Can we please Sorry. be very careful in this? And I know that the, the drafts people need to be careful in this. I've worked with kinship care before. There are not always official parents or carers for young people. You know, you could have somebody at 17 who has left home um, and is independent of any adults. So how does that work? I just, I, I don't want to discriminate against those young people who are genuinely have left home at 16 and don't have a parent or care. So let, let's not use the legislation to discriminate further on those young people. There's already loads of problems for those guys. Um, say, for instance, somebody's left a care home, somebody who's just not in with their family, at the rest of their family at all. Does that mean that they can't go, that they, a friend's parent or, or a, an over 18, 20 year old friend can't be their supervisor? I just, I, would, I don't want us to. No, absolutely. And that's a very valid point. Um... So the circumstances where a young person, as you say, potentially over it or potentially close to the age of 17 who has le left care and actually has nobody that is responsible for them or that yeah. could take could take responsibility. OK, OK, I'll take that. I'll take that away. It's just that as well. Do we want to use the education um, term where it's like one person, one adult per, I don't know, I think it's eight um, children. Um, I don't know if we're leaving it very vague then to be honest I could see somebody going well do you know what I'm the parent I'll be in the corner the rest of them can crack on there's 200 here well I'm the responsible person I think it's just whatever way you can think of going around this um, people will try and find a way so I'm just wondering you know do we need to put a number on it or is it just better leaving it vague no well I think there would be concerns about leaving it vague whenever there are young people involved and I know there's that it's slightly different whenever you do reach that close to 18 stage um but obviously no no i think i, th I think you're right and through the chair if that's okay I'll, I'll take that one away and consider that and we can look at the education system um and work out what the best way forward is on that thanks carol okay any other members have any comment they want to make on that nope I'm happy to move no, on then. Sorry, sorry, Chair. No, uh, you had touched on it and then Kelly expounded on it a wee bit and it was in terms of the, the, the parent issue and I had been thinking along the same lines that Kelly then touched on a, a kind of ratio, adult per, per child sort of thing. I don't think it can just be a, a parent because like you had said, you'll have children who maybe come along. There might be someone who has an event that they're bringing their 12 year old to example and they'll say to him or her to bring a, a wee friend to keep it <laughs> to sort of keep them company at it as well but you're not going to invite their parents necessarily as well so it's important to have that flexibility sure go ahead Fra. sure I, I i understand what people are saying i think but in, in many things we need to be careful about overthinking this and uh, you could end up putting clauses in or or uh, paragraphs in uh, that that uh, actually make it very very difficult that to, that to, they organise a function, and uh, the, there are many parents who don't go to these events, and uh, and a responsible adult uh, may suffice uh, uh, for that. You know, we we understand the reason we're even having this the, the debate, and why this is this has been raised, and it's to try and deal with. Uh, some of some of the difficulties there has been uh, for sports clubs and for other clubs uh, for for young people getting in to 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 enjoy awards or to enjoy that. So we just need to be careful about overthinking it because we could end up making it worse than it already is. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Fran. That's why we are asking that the definition um, should be interpreted as generously as possible because there are so many people that just don't fall into that conventional norm. Um, so, so, so I think sorry, you're right, Fran. Yeah, Go um, ahead, Mark. I had forgot to, to, to declare, and I'm just mm -hmm. a starting at this point, but from my experience, one of the biggest difficulties that this, the law as it currently st stands creates is around christenings. Do you know there's, there's premises with function rooms who can't have a christening yep. because if they, they, were, if they do, the baby can't go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah, definitely are lots and lots of problems as it stands at the moment. No, good one. Okay, anybody else want to make any comment on private functions, clauses 12 and 28? 
We'll move on. Yeah? Okay. We'll move on to clause then 13, which is delivery of intoxicating liquor to young persons. Um, again, Suzanne, I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Chair. This clause amends the licence in order to make it an offence to make a home delivery of alcohol to anyone under 18. There we are. Dart and sweet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Members, um, as you'll know, there was widespread support um, for the prohibition of delivery of alcohol to people under the age of 18 and requiring proof, proof of age to be shown and recorded upon delivery. However, there were a number of concerns about the over-exaggerated risk around such deliveries, the practical implications, the policing of this, and the view was expressed that this will have only a minimal impact on reducing alcohol consumption. It was highlighted that deliveries of alcohol by taxi to homes um, of, has been common for years, and while illegal, is rarely, the, the rules are rarely enforced around this. Um, some specific points were raised, and that was the need to ensure that delivery drivers, bicycle couriers delivering alcohol are over 18. Um, I think we had a bit of a discussion around this last week as well when it came up about the delivering of alcohol and being over 18, though we know that potentially someone can um, be 16 or 17 when it comes to motorcycle or car deliveries. Um, also in terms of age verification, evidence to us highlighted new technologies for age verification. The legislation may need to leave uh, the door open here and could this be done via regulations. Then the requirement for um, identification to be recorded upon delivery will present practical difficulties for retailers and their delivery staff. And also then how will online orders arriving through the post and from other jurisdictions be covered, the likes of your, your gin club or your wine club or your beer club. Um, and then the responsibility surrounding the delivery of alcohol should remain with the retailer and the young people should not be criminalised for taking delivery of alcohol. There are just some of the issues that were highlighted to us um, um, through uh, evidence sessions and through our young people's events. So I don't know if you want to answer any of those queries, Susanna or Carol. Yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a bit there um, that has been raised, Chair. So, I mean, in terms of um, it might only be a minimal impact, you know, it's, it's difficult to say what the impact would be, but ultimately there's a cumulative impact of all of the different provisions within the bill. Um, and the aim here is to reinforce the message that, you know, alcohol isn't an, order, an ordinary commodity. It can be harmful. Um, and especially whenever you're, you, you know, you, you bring young people into the mix. So um, the taxi the taxi issue, yes, it was discussed. Um, I think you mentioned there it was discussed as part of the 2016 bill again um and i think some of the some of the members were there and part of that discussion you know it, it is common knowledge people know that it happens um and the the ps and i had said that it was so difficult to enforce part of that was due to the lack of evidence and the lack of the lack of reporting um so although there was knowledge there it was you know having somebody actually come forward and say that and for obvious reasons they, they might not want to do that um, the underage event, or the underage, sorry, where they're they're an employee. Yes, that that was covered last week. Um, it is currently illegal. Um, it's illegal for the license holder or their servant or agent to send somebody out to deliver. Again, that comes back. That's a license holder responsibility. It's part of the terms and conditions of them holding a license. And I think I mentioned before, there are supermarkets out there where if you go on to order to do your online grocery order, um, there might be times of the day which you would actually be surprised to see that they don't deliver alcohol during those times and my understanding is that is because the driver at that time isn't 18 and um, so there are way there are there are ways that that you know it doesn't cause um too many difficulties for them i don't believe um the age verification and the new technologies again i think this did come up last week as well um you know the new technologies remove the human interaction, they remove the supervision there. Um, and whenever we're dealing with young people, there's always ways to circumvent those new technologies if there isn't any human interaction there. Um, and again, it's just making sure that um, the young people are, that the, the, the protection actually exists. Um, let me see what else did you talk about? Uh, it's just, I mean, we know that, uh, just the other bit there was to do with um, deliveries via post. I mean, I know because, uh, um, in a wine club as well, have been for years, and that just gets left at my front door. You know, there's no signature required, there's no nothing required. 
Um, though in saying that, I don't think my children would have dared even open the, open the box. Um, <laughs> and I don't think there's many young people out there would. But um, it, it, that's obviously not covered on this legislation where you're getting um, deliveries through post of alcohol. No, well, again, the, you know, the, the legislation and the remit of the remit of the bill is only in terms of the licensed premises in Northern Ireland. So, um, yeah, where, where the licensed premises are in Northern Ireland, we can require them to ensure that any of their um, agents or servants or agents um, ensure that that proof of AIDS check is carried out. I, do, I, mean, if, I suppose there's so many different places that deliver now. Royal Mail do have an age verification scheme um, for products such as alcohol or say the delivery of knives or something like that but it, it relies on the cost the customer notifying them at the at the point of postage um, and then they will ask for that age verification and um, whenever they get to the premises okay look thank you for that um members any comments or queries kelly i'm just thinking um we have an unusual and unique situation that's happening at the moment with covid um, I know by the time a delivery driver actually finds my house and makes it out into the sticks here, um, that they're quite happy just to leave something at the door and run onto their next delivery. Um, I'm just wondering, as you have said, um, it's really up to the the person who has sold it, you know, who's posting it, um, to make the the delivery people aware of what the contents are. But I'm just wondering, um, is that something we can even think about within this bill? Because as, as the chair has said, this could be a club, um, some sort of a wine or gin club or whatever that could originate outside of Northern Ireland. Um, I'm just wondering if, if this is something that we could be tying ourselves up in knots in and, and it's, it's a very difficult thing that will ever be enforced. Yeah, if it originates outside Ireland, we we would have no outside of Northern Ireland. We have no control over it. it I mean, the, the the order, the ninety six order, specifically relates to licensed premises. Um, the whole order is predicated on that. So it's the same issue as the buses. You know, if it's not it's, if it's not a licensed premises, there's nothing there's there's nothing that can be done under liquor licensing legislation. I suppose it's something again that we can just put into our report uh, uh, when we're doing our, our <coughs> final report on it. It's not going to be. Was there anything else then? that uh, we maybe, anything else members want to bring up onto this clause? No? Okay, can we move on then? <coughs> we'll move on then to clause 29, which is young people prohibited from bars. Um, so these, these clauses, uh, this clause is specific to sporting club members. Um, uh, Suzanne, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thanks, Chair. Under 18s will be permitted to stay in the bar area of a sporting club up to 11 p.m. during the summer months, which in the bill is the 1st of June to the 31st of August, and to attend one award ceremony at any other time of the year. Okay, thank you for that. Members, uh, you'll know there was considerable support for this proposal um, to allow under 18s to remain on premises of sporting clubs until 11 p.m. Um, during those summer months, as long as appropriate safeguards and appropriate adult supervision are in place and for attendance at one award ceremony. However, um, there was also considerable concerns um, uh, relating to health impacts and normalisation. Um, the following issues were also raised that the rules around children and licensed premises should not be relaxed, um, as this uh, risks early initiation with alcohol. The primary focus of sports clubs should be to remain to be the promotion of health and well-being, and as a community asset to support active, healthy lives free from a drinking culture. And the main effect of the proposal is to familiarise children again with drinking culture um, to the future benefit of the alcohol industry. Um, though we did get those who supported the proposal, but they also re uh, raised specific issues. So the Federation of Clubs highlighted that the time period should be from the 1st of April to the 31st of October, as the entire spectrum of sports probably requires much longer um, to enable academies to train. And the GAA specifically requested at least from May to the end of September. It was also requested that there would be a more general application of this clause, as many sporting competitions and ceremonies are not just confined to the summer months. And underage prize giving permitted on club premises to be increased to three times um, per, young, per young person per year, allowing for young people to be playing for a number of different teams or a number of different age um, profiles in those teams. And then the PSNI recommended that on young people attending an award ceremony, 
that the sporting club advises the police at least seven days in advance of when this is to take place. Um, so I do know again from our young persons event that we had that some of them had mentioned, um, one of the guys that was in my group had said that he plays rugby um, and he plays GAA as well. And the rugby, his rugby uh, season finishes in April. Um, so therefore then the season finish and the awards then have to wait then until um, June. He, um, others had said they play for various, whether it's maybe they pay for, um, they could pay it in, a, in an under 19s and under 15s um, for the same club. And therefore that penalises them as well in attending more than one award ceremony. So there's, there's been lots of issues flagged up over this. Um, and I know the committee certainly had a lot of discussion around this. And it might be something that we want to have a discussion with in closed session with Claire later. But just, um, Susanna or Carol, if you could answer any of those suggestions or questions. Yes, yeah, certainly, Chair. So again, back back to the policy intent that's supposed to begin with. You know, the policy is there to allow the young person after engaging in that sporting activity to go into the club for refreshment, um, especially whenever that sporting activity goes goes later into the evening. Currently, that's allowed until ten. So, you know, the exporting the, the activity goes on until ten o'clock in the middle of the summer, and then they're they're left to sort of stay outside. And um, it also allows a safe place then for them um, waiting for their transport home. So, um, I mean, the the safeguards remain. They can't be seated at the bar. They can't purchase alcohol. Nobody can purchase alcohol for them. No consumption. Those sorts of things. Um, in terms of the months, the months I believe were based on the response to the 2012 consultation, um, and that th those months, first of April to the 31st of October, um, were, were 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 the most voted for. Um, I suppose, for want of a better term, I mean, we've, we've, we have we have taken the thoughts of minister on this one, given the amount of evidence that 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 has been received, saying that those months are inadequate now. Um, and Minister would be minded to consider any increase then in those months if the committee would, would propose for that for an increase. Um, in terms of the prize given, the prize given isn't limited to the summer months. The prize given could be any time of year. Um, but again, given the evidence now that has come forward, um, I mean, officials did. We engaged with the Education Authority Youth Services, took took forward some work for us as part of the department's 2019 consultation. Um, but they did acknowledge that there weren't very many um, young people in attendance who were members of, of, of sporting clubs. Um, so, you know, get, given that new evidence again, Minister would be minded to consider increasing that cap um, if, if, the committer, if, the, if the committee would, would propose to do that. Okay, I know we certainly did receive uh, a lot of evidence about the, the, these increases, and it is good to know that the minister would be minded um, if the committee um, were in agreement with that. I have Robin um, has just motion to come in. So it's just <clears throat> just a minor point, Chair. I think, um, and it uh, stretches back to our previous discussion on uh, clause twelve. <clears throat> the British Beer British Beer and Pub Association make the comment uh, about the support this proposal to allow under 18s. But within that, they make the safeguard request that it be an appropriate adult supervision in place. So they're using in their submission on this clause, the point that we were discussing uh, under clause 12, appropriate adult supervision. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Robin, for that, members want to come in on this um, issue to do with um, the sporting clubs. Go ahead, Kelly. Does this mean that the committee, uh, just for more of a technical clarification point, does this mean that the committee would need to put forward an amendment for the minister to consider, or would the, the department be minded if we give something through to the minister now to amend that? themselves no the minister will bring it forward if the committee um would be in agreement with it also we don't need to do an amendment i mean the best way of doing this is for the minister to bring forward rather than the committee um but certainly then the department and to forgive me suzanne and carl for answering um suzanne and carl take this back all of these deliberations and conversations um back to the department so they'll certainly know um but in our closed session today with claire um we will finalize what we would like to see 
um, any differences or any um, increases or any decreases, whatever it might be um, within the bill. We'll do that with Claire this afternoon. That will go to the department and the department will come back and say whether they're minded or not. And if they're not minded, then that's whenever we will come in and uh, put our own amendments down. Um, sorry, isn't that right? Suzanne and Carol are there. <laughs> That's right, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, any other comment then on the issue around um, clubs and permitted hours and permitting young people on premises? No? Yeah, Chair. Sorry, go ahead, Sinead. Yeah, no, just to reiterate, it really hit, hit home for me when we had that evidence taking session with the young people. Um, you know, that you will have different age groups. Uh, you'll have maybe somebody playing soccer, somebody playing football. Um, maybe somebody playing camogie, somebody playing football. So, um, you know, to restrict it to one one award ceremony per year is probably going to be very problematic for those those young people and their their parents. So, yeah, later on in our closed session, it's it's probably something we want to thrash out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Chair, Shania. sorry, just just through you. Go ahead. Sorry, it was just a, um where where you're talking about um young people who maybe play different different um different types of sport. If they are in different clubs, then it's this. This would relate to each individual club, so that young person wouldn't be restricted to only attending one events or one award ceremony in one club. If they play for three different clubs, three different types of sport, um, it would only be in respect of um, if they potentially played for the same club at different levels that they might have to go to, um, you know, different awards nights. But again, as uh, as as I mentioned earlier, the minister would be minded to consider um, an increase on that cap if the if the committee decided to do so. Sure. Go ahead, Fra. Uh, again, this this is a an issue as you know has been uh, debated uh, for a, a lengthy period of time. I've always had the opinion, especially uh, and uh, the 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 likes of which need, uh, and and many people who live rurally. Uh, who the, were the, the 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 life and soul of the communities is 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 the GAA. They don't only have one team; they could have multiple teams of uh, male and female, different ages. I know where I live, uh, the the lo local soccer team uh, may have nine juvenile teams before you even go into uh, the 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 adult the adult teams, and uh, and then if you take the parents, supporters, and things like that, who would buy into some of the stuff. So I, I, I think that we, we, we really need to be looking. I think what we have taken on here is ways that we can, in many ways, liberalise uh, the, the laws that they allow young people uh, the, the, the responsibility and the, 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 the time to be able to go to premises uh, and take part. And, and what for many of them would be one of the big occasions of their lives, and that is either lifting trophies or winning medals. So I think we need to keep that in mind. And it's not about restricting it's about helping as much as possible, uh, and, it, and I say about in terms of the, the local uh, GAA. I know that uh, in, in the falls uh, there's a GAA team there, and they have uh, multiple multiple teams of different ages: uh, 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 handball teams, they have uh, football teams, uh, they have camogie teams, they have hurling teams, they have uh, ladies football teams. So. Uh, what what you need to be careful is in that you don't just start to, uh, and trying to do good start to isolate uh, many of the people that want to want to participate in these things. So I agree certainly with the minister that uh, that there probably needs to look uh, at uh, increasing or uh, the, the 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 amount of times that people uh, can use this. Okay. Because at some stage in the future we're going to have to come back to this. No, thank you, Fra. And you and I know we sat looking at this bill nearly 10 years ago, so we did. Yeah. 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 And a lot of the issues have not changed um, since yeah. then as well. Um, can I just ask then, just on a point to, to do with, um, say, a, a, an event that is in a, a, a social club that does have a bar, um, if it's an underage event, does is the bar have to be closed on that occasion? Um I think that chair that would be it would be a commercial decision for the club if you're talking about an underage event the club would have to go to the court anyway to prove suitability so if it's a one room yeah club if that's what you're yeah, you're it is, it sort is. of describing yeah, yeah I, th I think i mean the court would make that decision and if the court was if the court was satisfied that it was actually a suitable place then um ultimately yes if it was a private event taking place in the only place in that club 
then members of the public wouldn't be allowed to attend, but well, wouldn't be members of the public because it would be um, for registered clubs, only members and guests can attend anyway. But no, anybody that wasn't part of that function wouldn't be able to attend. And that would ultimately be a, a decision for that club to decide whether that was something they were willing to do. Yeah, because I suppose for some clubs, it means that they have to close down to their regulars who might attend there on a, a weekly, nightly basis um, in order to hold this type of an event. So that's up to the club then to balance that up um, as well. No, that's fair enough. That's OK. Uh, members, any further questions on, on this clause? Before, I mean, that's that set of clauses. Um, now you finish, so it is. It's just to ask any further questions from the, while the department are here on any of that. No? Okay, members, I'm, I'm just going to then propose, before we move on to the sixth set of, of, of our clauses, that we just take a short break and we'll reconvene then. Um, what time is it now? We'll reconvene at 11. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, welcome back. We're going to then move on to our sixth set, um, which is one clause, which is clause 22. Um, that's related to extending the licensed area of a sporting club in order for a function to be held. The summary of evidence we have received in this clause can be found in document 6, which starts at page 319. So, clause 22. Suzanne, can you give us an overview on this? Yes, thanks, Chair. Sporting clubs will be permitted to apply to the police to extend the area of its premises, which is registered to supply alcoholic drinks for the purpose of holding a function. Police can grant an authorization up to six times in any year, and each authorization should last one day, but in exceptional circumstances, can last up to five days. The number of authorizations can be amended by regulations. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Okay, so members on this clause as well, there was also um, issues around the health perspective. Again, um, linking of sporting clubs and alcohol consumption remains a concern for some in terms of um, linking alcohol with sporting success and the normalisation of alcohol consumption. Um, also, the general public health views were highlighted of not supporting any legislative changes that may lead to an increase of alcohol consumption. However, uh, there was also support expressed for the proposals, um, which relate to registered clubs as clubs provide a valuable amenity in local areas and provide young people and the wider community with activities and opportunities to socialise safely. Um, there was concern expressed from some in the hospitality sector that clubs are not always following the current rules regarding signing non-members in and out, etc., and that this, on top of the cheaper prices that they can charge for alcohol, needs to be addressed as it has a negative impact on local hospitality businesses. And then members of the PSNI express, express made a or made a number of comments relating to registered clubs. Their comments are to be found in document six at page 319 at points seven and eight. I would ask members if they have any comments around the specific points raised, which are that uh, issue of clubs wishing to alter their premises, should they apply to the court before any work is carried out, rather than just advise the court when the registration is due for renewal, and also concern about the use of one-day memberships potentially used to circumvent the policy intent of the current legislation to allow the public access to a club event rather than the avail of the sports facilities. Um, so just members, if they have anything they want to bring up on those issues. And then we'll bring in Suzanne and Carol. Kelly, did you want to ask something around that? Or? I was. It was just how um, we would deal with the issue that generally was raised by the police about the alteration of premises during the registration period. Um, is the department minded to tighten up on that a bit or leave that um, so that it's only at renewal that the, the police would have to be notified? It's not something, um, through you, Chair, it's not something that um, we have... We have actually been advised about so far, um, as far as I understand. So, should the committee agree to propose one, we'll obviously bring it to the minister for consideration. There does seem to be a disparity between the process for licensed premises and registered clubs. Um, so, where licensed premises, <clears throat> excuse me, is required to go to the courts in advance, um, the registered clubs don't seem to have to do that. Um, there are a number of reasons why you know the, the licensed premises process is, is done in that way that you have to go to the courts um, you know the, 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 the courts also have a part if they're not content with the suitability of the changes of a club 
they could refuse renewal um, under the current system. Um, similarly, in the in the licensing system, if, if a licensed premises didn't actually go to court to, to, um, to get that approval in advance and continued on and, and made the amendments um, and then brought it back to, to the court at renewal stage, a court, a court can order a licensed premises to actually return the premises as much as they can to the original state. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely things there to consider. And as I say, if, if, if the committee was minded to propose an amendment, then we'll, we'll, we'll of course, bring that to the Minister for consideration. Okay. Um, I have to declare a bit of an interest there, Chair, because um, one of the, the correspondents is actually my local, um, and my, my daughter works there whenever it is open. Um, they have raised about non-members signing in and out. And I know that a lot of sporting clubs do hold an extraordinary amount of very successful charity events and that would be non-members attending. I'm just wondering if there's any further consideration on that one day membership. Yeah, so through you, Chair, again, the, the, the issue of the, the non-members attending for charity events, it's covered under functions and that's perfectly legal. They, they, they can do that and that's fine. The one day memberships issue, um, my, my, I believe that the intention there is say, for example, you've got golfers um, with different, you know, at, at different clubs. This allows a golfer to, or any other person who's partaking of the sport, to attend another club where they aren't a member without having to go through the process of having to be signed in or having to be sort of in the company of a member the entire time. Um, you know, generally, if, 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 if anybody else, any other member of the public goes, that, that has to happen. They have to be signed in. They have to be there, the responsibility of that member. So this allows somebody who actually partakes in that to, to, to go and give it a go, I suppose. The intent there is that it's the, the, the sporting facility that the clubs provide. Um, so yes, there have been instances where um, a clubs appear to have been advertising quite openly, you know, not a member, not a problem. Um, come on ahead, pay a fee and come and sit in the bar and watch, say, you know, this, a rugby match all day. Um, so, I mean, that has been raised. The, the views of Minister has been sought on that and Minister would be minded to consider an amendment to clarify that issue um, if, if the Minister, if the, the committee has considered it and agree or decide to propose such an amendment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Because, I, I mean, I, I listened to a news article yesterday about um, about there the, are restrictions at the moment and about golfers, and it does happen quite often where um, golfers will pay the, the one-day membership to go to another club or to go and play with friends or whatever, and that, that is something that will happen more once that we see the relaxations lifted, where you'll have people who are not full members, um, but they're there purely for sport, and it happens with all other sports as well. They're not there to... To sit and drink in the bar and we know they're not open anyway at the moment but um we will see that coming out of COVID that there will be people um that will just have one day our guest membership rather than full membership of various sports clubs um so i think we just need to be just careful around that um though i'd say generally on the whole it is for sport that this happens and it's not for sitting in the bar but yeah i just need to be minded um members any other comments on that clause or we'll move on Yep, we'll move on then. Okay, then, members, we're going to move then to the seventh set of clauses. Um, we've now come to part three of the bill, which is the general clauses. So you've got 33, 34, 35, 36, Schedule 1 and Schedule 2. Um, Suzanne, can you please give an overview of all of these clauses in part three, um, which are more te technical in nature? Um, so that is 34, Minor and Consequential Amendments. 35 repeals, 36 commencement of the short title, and Schedule 1 minor and consequential amendments and Schedule 2 repeals. Yes, thanks Chair. We've also included 33 there as well. So Clause 33, which is interpretation, this clause is self-explanatory. It sets out the meaning of references to the licensing and clubs order and statutory provision in the bill. Clause 34 is minor and consequential, consequential amendments. This clause allows the department to make regulations as a result of the act. Regulations can be amended, repealed and revoked. The clause ensures that any regulations that amend primary legislation must be laid before and approved by the assembly. Clause 35 is repeals. This clause directs readers to schedule two, which sets out the provisions which are to be repealed. Clause 36 is commencement and short title. 
This clause allows for a number of sections to be commenced the day after royal assent. These are the removal of restrictions at Easter, interpretations, the making of regulations and the associated repeals. Schedule 1 is minor and consequential amendments and Schedule 2 repeals. Schedule 1 makes a number of amendments to the licensing and clubs order as a result of the earlier clauses. These are generally removing or adding references to old and new provisions. Uh, as referred to earlier, Schedule 2 lists the provisions within both orders that are repealed. Okay, so <coughs> thank you for that. Uh, members, any comments or questions um, on these general clauses? No, okay, do we happy? Uh, we move on then to uh, our next. Uh, we're, next, we're going to move just to just some suggested additional measures. Members, happy we move on? Yeah? Okay. Okay, members, we've now completed our first pass through the clause of the bill. Um, I would now like to move on to consider a number of issues that were raised in our evidence sessions that are not currently included in the bill. So, members, if you could turn to document 8 on page 330, where there's suge suggested additional measures. So, the first one then I'm going to go to is clubs and PSNI entry. Members, the Federation of Registered Clubs are seeking an amendment to Article 42 of the 1996 order so that the PSNI's rights of entry are consistent with those for other licensed premises in Northern Ireland. They do not object to the PSNI having right of entry, provided that it is always in the pursuance of crime, similarly to other facets of the hospitality industry and other business sectors. Um, so it's just uh, any comments members want to make on that. I remember that evidence session where they felt that they were, were not being treated the same. Um, so it's just uh, members, any comments? And then I'll go to Suzanne and Carol. No, no comments on that. Suzanne, Carol, is there any way around this within the bill? Chair, I, I've had a look at it. From what I can tell, there's very little difference between um, the PSNI rights of entry for private members clubs and for the licensed premises. Um, in, in terms of the registered clubs, it does say that everyone present in the club can be can be questioned by the police. Um, but ultimately, the private members, they are private members clubs. So the people that are present should be members and the Federation themselves have said that the members effectively own the club. Um, so I just, I would need more information in terms of what the concerns really are, because from what I can tell, there's very, very little difference between what the police can do under liquor licensing law and the registered clubs law. Okay. All right. Members, any comment on that? No? Okay, then we'll move on to number two, which is minimum unit pricing. Members, we know that the minimum unit pricing is outside, certainly the scope of this bill and lies with the Department of Health. We have already received assurances from the Minister for Health that he is committed to a consultation on this matter. But given the amount of evidence we heard in favour of this from across submissions, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge at this stage and also to highlight that evidence to us hi highlighted with loyalty schemes are within the, the, the scope of this bill can coexist with minimum pricing, uh, minimum use unit pricing, but it was noted that this further supported maintaining the cash uh, equivalency of loyalty points. However, there was some evidence highlighted that minimum unit pricing will have limited impact on reducing alcohol consumption and preventing alcohol-related harms as long as large companies continue to sell cheap alcohol. The PHA is very supportive of the potential adoption of minimum unit pricing and noted in its submission that a 10% increase in the price of alcohol would lead to a 5% decrease in its consumption and the minimum unit pricing would affect high-risk drinkers and, uh, and the, the off-trade most. Again, members, this is not within the scope of the bill, though I do think it's important that we have this um, stated. All of this, the stuff that we're going on to do now is stated on the record um, for the committee when they finalise their report. Um, members, any comments or queries that want to uh, issue on that or content with that? Content. Content. Um, Department, I know again, I'm not going to come and ask you because it's not within the scope of the bill. Um, but um, it's certainly something that I, I would imagine that, that the department is working along with, with the, the health minister, to see that, that this consultation is rolled out before the end of the mandate. Absolutely, Chairman. Officials, we've, we've worked closely with Department of Health colleagues for a number of years. Um, 
and DFC and Department of Health um, ministers um, have met and discussed the issue a number of times as well. So I think there is a general acceptance there across the board that you know it won't, it won't solve all the problems, but that you know if you look at the available evidence, it does clearly demonstrate that it has a potential um, there to have quite a significant positive impact. And when you, whenever you're talking about the negative impact of alcohol-related harm, um, it does come down to. to to saving lives at the end of the day, whenever you look at um, the numbers that we have for the harmful use of alcohol and the deaths associated with it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Members, any comments? Are content that I move on? Yeah, content? Okay, well, number three then is entertainment venues, cinema, cinemas, bowling alleys. Um, so members, we heard evidence from Omniplex Cinemas, Movie House Cinemas and Brunswick Movie Bowl, all requested that cinemas be allowed to sell alcohol stating that there was no justification to permit alcohol to be sold to those attending a theatre, but not those attending the cinema. It was highlighted to us that all neighbouring jurisdictions permitted the sale of alcohol in cinemas in certain circumstances, allowing for the development of unique cinema experience. The businesses were keen to highlight the evolution in the cinema offering, with a growing trend towards cinema being more of a luxury experience, live streaming operas and ballets, etc., and they were open to consideration of the time restrictions. It is believed uh, by the cinema businesses that this could be achieved by cinemas being expressly included in the list of places of public entertainment, which currently lists only theatres, ballrooms and racetracks, and it could be the same licence as theatres have at the moment. Members, in addition, the Jet Centre requested that the committee review the rules surrounding bowling alleys, and the service of alcoholic beverages at the tables situated at the lanes, rather than making a differentiation, a dif yeah, differentiation of the restaurant area and the bowling area. It was requested that restaurant licences are extended to include all seated parts of the bowling alley, or that has the or or that it has the opinion to license bowling lanes separately. Um, so just um, just want to ask maybe if the department could come in on that. You know from our witness sessions that um, this issue has been raised. And just um, uh, any feedback from the department if the minister is minded to look at this um, at all. Certainly, Chair. So um, I mean these particular issues haven't been haven't been brought to the minister yet, but in terms of you know increasing the category of premises where on sales are permitted hasn't been part of the policy and it hasn't been you know so far as the the review of the the reform of liquor licensing has been going on going the aim of this bill and the aim of the um 2016 bill as well was twofold so yes we're looking at assessing the hospitality industry and sort of supporting tourism and and the economy but the other side of that is to contribute to Department of Health object objectives. We we'll say objections there, sorry, objectives um, of a reduction in alcohol and alcohol-related harm. And to do that, it's that has to be done through a reduction in consumption. So, if you were to increase the number of premises available where alcohol consumption could actually take place on the premises, you're going to achieve the opposite of what your aim is. Um, so, you know, increasing those categories of premises where on sales are permitted is, isn't part of the current policy. It's a significant change to the current system. It hadn't been consulted on before. Um, it could lead to, I mean, well, it ultimately would lead to an increase in the number of licensed premises if, if you're talking about licensing cinemas and the amount of those that, that are around the place. Um, in terms of if it's something, in terms of, of, of the committee's deliberations, um, there's a lot of things to consider. You know, cinemas at the minute are one of the few places that are entirely family friendly, entirely alcohol free, and not just family friendly. There's a lot of people um, who wouldn't choose to be around alcohol, and that that cinema option is there for them to go to for entertainment. Um, you know, you'd need to look at the the permitted hours, um, the significant amount of under 18s who 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 visit the cinemas, um, whether alcohol can be brought into the screens. So how safe would that be if it was brought into the screens? Um, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the lighting and the dark spaces. It's all very practical, but you know, what's the potential there for young people to get access to that alcohol? Um, who's expected to deal with any of the issues? Is it the, the staff there that would be expected to deal with issues if anything went wrong with somebody consuming alcohol? Um, and again, they're in a screen. Um, in licensed premises, you, everybody has to be visible. Um, if you want to alter your premises, that's something that the, 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 the courts have to consider. Have you altered it in so much as you actually lose visibility 
um, of, of people that are consuming alcohol. So, I mean, there is a lot to consider there. Um, you mentioned bowling alleys as well. Um, so, and yes, there are currently bowling alleys that would have um, alcohol being served, but the reference to the fact that it's, you know, restricted the table, that's because they have a restaurant license in force. It's the only way that they would be able to get it, um, you know, but bar, bar actually getting a pub license. Bowling alleys aren't currently one of those um, one of those categories that can that can apply for a license. And again, there would be serious questions over allowing alcohol to be consumed at the actual lanes, which has been the request purely from a safety perspective. Um, I imagine the police would have something to say about that. Whenever you're talking about people on a slippery floor with a, I don't know what weight bowling balls are, but you know, and and throw alcohol into the mix. So again, it's a it's a family environment. You know that most of them provide, although obviously if they have that restaurant, that licensed restaurant part, there would be large groups of young people, you know, sort of the, the, the 16 and around that age, who they don't have to be supervised because they're at a bowling alley and they aren't supervised. Um, so it's 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 something it's something that the committee has to consider. I mean, you know, I, I, I know of a of a bowling alley that does have a licensed restaurant who have to have door staff on. Um, every weekend and who would be seen to be regularly, you know, affecting people that have had too much alcohol. So it's just something that, um, that there, there's a lot there to consider um, as part of your deliberations, Chair. Okay, thank you. And I suppose it's all about uh, all about balance. And I suppose uh, play devil's advocate. Um, I mean, certainly from a health perspective, um, our increased licensing hours, our, our uh, Easter opening, many other things will actually be lead to a much in higher increase of alcohol consumption than a cinema being able to sell um, a, a couple of glasses of wine, of wine that somebody's going to watch a, a live stream of a ballet or something else. Um, so I, I think um, when we talk about balance and we talk about alcohol consumption, I don't see um, cinemas and bowling alleys being the type of place where we'll see over alcohol consumption, but I stand to be corrected on that. Um, I certainly um, uh, I know the committee very much. Um, we're, we're quite sympathetic um, to the cinemas and their, their plight. So I think that's something then that we will have to consider when we go into closed session as to whether we want to um, uh, support that call. And I mean, I have been to cinemas in, in America and in other places where it, it, it actually, uh, and bowling alleys actually, I was in a bowling alley in America where it was quite, I mean, there was no issues where you took your beer to your bowling lane, but you know, maybe it's, we just have a, a different way that we treat alcohol. I don't know. Um, members, any comments that they want to raise on this? No. No, nothing. Okay, then will we move on then to our next piece? Yeah. Okay, then oh. we're going. Sorry, Alex is... sorry, Alex, didn't see you. Go ahead. <laughs> Is there any evidence of issues anywhere across the rest of the UK with um, the cinemas having to sell alcohol? Is, is there any evidence that um, the officials have that this is this is a bad idea or anything like that? Well, officials, I mean, we have looked into into what happens in other jurisdictions, um, it's, there doesn't seem to be very much information at all, even in terms of um, which which of those venues have licenses or not. Um, I mean, in the Republic, the Republic have um, different categories. So they have what's called a publican's license, um, which is for on sales. So the, in terms of the cinema, it's actually a licensed premises within the cinema. So the cinema isn't licensed, it's a licensed premises that is based inside the cinema, but it can only be used for functions before and after the screenings. Um, in GB, it's a very different system altogether, as you know. Um, any premises can apply, um, and they have to set out their case and their operating plan. So the information is limited, but ultimately, again, increasing the, the number of on-sales premises isn't, isn't part of, of, of the policy. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. All right, members, so happy enough. Uh, Shania, did you want to come in? Or by... Yeah, yeah, sure. And I, I accept um, what officials are saying there totally. Um, but I'm just wondering, is there any scope uh, within this to maybe look at, um, I don't know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. So, you know, if there were, if the cinema was showing a more theatre a theater type uh, event, you know, say like a ballet or a, a, a concert or something like that, or if the, the movie was set over 18s, um, that they could maybe apply for you know, a, a license or whatever that would allow them to 
to sell alcohol at those those types of screenings. So again, just playing devil's advocate, maybe it's something that we can tease out or, or get some clarity on. Okay. Certainly, will. I mean, say it's not it's it it it's not a current category. So you would be adding a new category, um, and that is a significant change to the legislation that hasn't been consulted on. Um, and obviously, whenever the the original policy was agreed, it was shared with um, the Attorney General as well. Um, so it would just be again, if it's something that the committee is minded to do and um, puts a proposal forward in terms of how that might work, we will obviously, of course, bring it to to Minister for consideration. Okay, thanks, Carol Kelly. Can I just double check at this current moment? Could um, one of those cinemas um, use someone else's license to apply for an occasional license, or you know, have a pub apply for an occasional license for uh, you know a, a film to have alcohol served at it? I believe they could, but again, the occasional license, the, the license holder that's going to run that event for them, they would need to bring that to the court and explain to the court why that occasional license is necessary um, and whether it actually meets the criteria for an occasional license. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, members, um, happy that we move forward? Yeah? Okay. Um, next one then, number four, is Article 31. Um, members, the Law Society would like to have seen retrospective Article 31 applications in the Bill, as there are occasions when minor alterations to licensed premises have been made in the belief that there was no requirement to seek court approval before they were made. Such, such instances might more effectively be dealt with by introducing a retrospective provision of Article 31 applications. Also in connection with Article 31, the Wine and Spirit Trade Association believe the bill should address the 75-25 split of tills in supermarkets where alcohol cannot be purchased as the relaxation of the rule over COVID um, worked extremely well without any problems. Um, so then just in relation to Article 31, Suzanne or Carol, anything you want to um, add to that? Yes, sure. So Article 31, it, it does it does clearly set out what type of alterations um, a licence holder would need to bring to the court to receive approval. Um, I mentioned earlier there that if a magistrate's court decides that the the you know retrospectively um, at renewal stage, if they find out that there has been an alteration to premises and that they're not content with the suitability of that, they can order that licence holder to restore the premises, which will obviously have a cost associated to it. Um, there would be concerns there just about if you you know introduce retrospective applications, you could be increasing the number of times that that actually happens. At least at this stage, they go to the court and the court decides whether it's suitable or not. Um, so say there, there there would be that potential to to increase the number of orders for um, returning a premises to origin, its original state if the license holders you know decided to take that risk if there was a retrospective option. Okay, thanks. What about the issue around the, the, the till split in, you know, in our supermarkets and stuff like that? It's given that we've seen the relaxation during COVID. Um, is there anything further on that? So the 75-25 or 75-25 split in terms of which tills are licensed and not licensed. So that's the ones that have the, the little ticks on them. Um, there was a fair amount of investigation done as this, as you can imagine, as part of those um, input for those regulations. That split isn't in current licensing law. Um, we understand it's a court recommendation. Um, it's not in any of the, it's not in the licensing order and it's not in any of the um, regulations either. So it's not something that we would have control over. Um, the licensing legislation does state that you have to have non-alcohol tills. Um, it doesn't say the number and there's obviously very valid reasons for those number of alcohol tills. So the relaxation over COVID, um, it was a specific um, regulation within the COVID regs that allowed any till to be used. Um, and that was really to allow for adequate social distancing during the busy run up to, to Christmas and New Year. There were extremely large queues forming at the alcohol tills. Um, people obviously, they were only going out maybe there once a week, trying to get everything done in the one-stop shop um, and get home safely. And there was just such a large amount of people that social distancing was becoming an issue. So it was to allow those premises to um, to, to have adequate social distancing in place and say it's it, it's not something that's in the license in order the seventy five twenty five. Okay, thank you for that, members. Any comment or query they want to raise under this Article Thirty One, Kelly? 
I just wanted to ask, um, given the fact that the courts do close down over the summer, has this caused an issue up to now? Because I know that, um, say, for instance, the police have been out and they have noticed that, um, say, a bar, does, their beer garden hasn't been appropriately licensed. Um, it effectively means then that that um, venue cannot proceed to submit an application um, and you know until such times as the, the courts are sitting again. I'm just wondering if there's been any issue for the department over the years um, with that this is this is an issue that you know the courts take a break over the summer um so it means then that applications are delayed i wouldn't be 100 percent sure on it i know for certain issues the courts will sit um but it would be something i would need to go back and check with the courts on um chair it wouldn't be something that i would have a working knowledge of okay, okay. all right members can we move on then to um our fifth point then which is public health and links to license granting and renewals. Members of the Department of Health and the British Medical Association highlighted similar issues regarding that the granting or renewal of licenses should be considered in terms of the impact of public health in an area and the alcohol outlet density. Um, higher higher um, alcohol outlet density has been associated with various aspects of alcohol-related harm, including alcohol-related accidents, self-reported injuries, suicide, alcohol-related road traffic accidents and fatalities. Um, the BMA highlighted that this could be achieved by making public health a core objective and statutory obligation under licensing. Um, members, this would maybe be a place now to discuss how the committee feels about building in some aspect of public health consideration into the bill. As was highlighted to a number of public health evidence and submissions, the public health agency would support the inclusion of an explicit statement that the protection of public health and promotion of well-being is a key objective of the Northern Ireland um, licensing bill. And in England, courts can take into account potential public health implications. We know that there may be higher rates of off-sales in public <coughs> houses in areas of disadvantage. Um, courts can then take it into account when issuing any further licences and may have a further ne negative impact on public health locally. So members, have they any comments they want to make around this and around uh, the possible inclusion of even some sort of statement within the bill around protecting public health? Uh, Robin? Chair, I, I was under the impression that uh, uh, public health was a integral part of what we were trying to, to do uh, within this, this bill. And I think it would be remiss of us, I think we all know uh, the, the problems that there are out in society at the moment, or uh, parts of society at the moment, uh, and I do think it would be remiss of us not to, uh, to, to, to use your words, Chair, at least make comment yeah. on the public health issues within the bill. <clears throat> Okay, member. Any other members want to make any comments on on this aspect? No. Okay. Well, that's maybe something we need to discuss then as well afterwards, um, because we knew, it has been raised with us with many many people um, about the, the public health aspect of of um, some of the liberalisation of licensing laws that we have, um, and also I mean that that's maybe as well where we we talked about last week about reviews and things like that. Um, where these things maybe need to be reviewed in a time frame for review. Um, so, members, we can go on and discuss that further if members want to. Um, Carol, Suzanne, any comment you want to make on that, just? Chair, I think I mean, if, you know, the regime here is a court based one um, in terms of alcoholic de density and the concerns about you know, over provision. The court is required whenever granting a license for a power and off license, it has to satisfy itself that the current number of that same type of licenses. So if you're going for a pub, the current number of pubs, and if you're going for an off license, the current number of off licenses are inadequate before granting that license. Um, introducing objectives has been brought up over many, many years. Um, and f to introduce objectives into licensing law, you know, the officials would believe would require a fundamental change to the regime here. Um, there's there's mention often about the system in, in GB, um, and I'm sure everybody's aware at this stage, it's the local authorities um, that issue licenses in GB, and they're ha they have licensing committees, they have licensing forums. Each time a prospective licensee goes to apply for a license, um, they have to produce an operating plan, and in that operating plan, it clearly sets out 
you know, what type of premises it is, what the business is going to be, what their opening hours are going to be, what the policy in respect to children are going to be. It also has to set out how it will meet the licensing objectives. So that licensee has to be held to account for how what it specifies in that operating plan is how it will protect and improve public health. So that's something then that the licensing committees can take into consideration and say the regime here is a court based one, the, the letter of the law is followed, the actual those those objectives and having somebody prove how they are how they intend to protect or improve public health. Equally the other ones, the you know, the prevention of crime and disorder and um, public safety and public nuisance and protection of children from harm. Um it's not something that a, a court would be able to take into consideration. So it it is a fundamental change. Um albeit health yes is 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 extremely important and is is part of the, the aim of the bill to address those issues as well. Okay, members, any comments? Okay, we'll discuss this one maybe later as well with Claire. Um, then can we move on then to number six, which is conference centre licences. Um, members, the PS and I highlight to, highlighted to us the difficulties around policing of conference centre licences, leading to complaints from other parts of the hospitality sector. PS and I are aware of a number of venues that have never or rarely held a conference, but are hosting weddings. Um, one of the requirements of the conference centre licence is that conference rooms must be used exclusively or mainly as meeting rooms. Um, again, Suzanne or Carol, any comment you want to make on that? Um, yes, yeah, so through you, Chair, that there are there are regulations in the licence in order that specify the requirements, um, and that meeting room one is obviously one of them. Um, before a conference centre can go to a court. Um, the Northern Ireland Tourist Board, or well, trading as Tourism NI now, they have to be. They have to provide a certificate stating that the conference centre actually conforms with those regulations. Now, the police raised this with us, I think, at the end, um, at the end of 2019, probably as part of the departmental consultation. And as part of that, um, I've held discussions with Tourism NI, who are confident that when it, whenever they are visiting and, and, and carrying out their checks, that they are only issuing certificates for the premises that, that, that do conform with those regulations. So it's they've assured me that the relevant checks are taking place and, and it's it's very difficult to say what more can be done after that. Um, and I suppose it's a matter if, if, as well of, of they're, they're paying a different price for a conference license um, to what, uh, you know, a, a, an entertainment license or a, a pub license and all of the rest of it. So I suppose just that others just want to see that they're being treated fairly. Um, so I, I don't know if maybe the police um, can give us any figures on that, where that is happening. Or I suppose we've had a year where there's been no conferences or on very few wedding venues um but it it, it was I, I wasn't aware of it until we did see that submission that this was happening to the extent that the psni are, are stating that it's happening but um okay so but you're confident then that this is this is not a, a major issue well said with you know held discussions with the the um tourism ni and the the, the people there that were that are in charge of issuing the certificates, um, and they actually they were concerned whenever I whenever I raised the issue and reminded them of what their requirement was under under the legislation. So that they, they seem to be surprised now that that there was any issue. Okay, no, I was I, I was the same opinion. Okay, members, any comment on that on number six conference centre licences? No. Okay, we'll move on then to the surrender principle, number seven. Um, members, as we know, the bill does not include any changes to the surrender principle. For licensing here in Northern Ireland, however, a number of interesting issues were highlighted. Um, the Institute for Social Marketing and Health, uh, University of Stirling, supported the NI surrender principle as it prevents proliferation. I can't even say that word. I spent lots of license preferences, um, but it did accept that the problem faced around pub closures and the potential for the license. Um, uh, being then brought, bought by a supermarket, they recommended tweaking current system rather than ever abolishing the surrender principle. 
Um, the surrender principle ha was highlighted to us as a source of great pain to retailers simply because there were are very few licenses about and those that are around sell for a couple of uh, 100 times their face value and many people in the industry will have the license and will view the value associated with that license as part of the goodwill built up in their business however it pushes up the entry cost to new operators um, again we know this is not within the bill i know mark has raised this on on occasions um, i don't know where mark is i don't know if he oh mark has fallen out of the he's in the audience not in the spotlight. Can we bring Mark in, please, if he's there? Oh, he's back in. Thank you. I know this is one Mark had raised. Mark, I know um, about especially rural um, uh, towns and villages were uh, to do with the surrender principle. Have you any comment you want to make on that, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm noting the responses, and I know there's a separate wee subsection for or on rural proofing. Yeah. Uh, further yeah. down. I, I do obviously accept and understand and appreciate the fact that it prevents a proliferation of licensed Thank premises. You, Mark. <laughs> but the fact is as well that, that this uh, principle almost prohibits or will massively, massively restricts any new licensed premises. You know, so, so it is certainly inhibiting uh, the, the growth of, of new businesses, I think, in that respect. Uh, it's a very, very tricky one, I suppose, given particularly the difficulty that uh, licensees have had over a number of years, and particularly this last year. That That's why I was thinking more something along the lines of a, a community need license. It just sort of floated that last week. I don't know if there'd be an opportunity to, to thrash that out further with officials at some point, but I think that's something that would certainly bear consideration. Okay, thanks, Mark. I'll bring you in again then when we get to the, the rural um, proofing number 10. Um, uh, anybody else want to raise any comment? Sure. Sorry, go ahead, Safra. Yeah? Yeah, sure. That's, that's, that's just interesting. Uh, I wasn't at the committee meeting last week. It's just interesting to, to listen to that aspect of what Mark suggests in the community need. What what does that entail? What does it mean uh, in, 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 in paper? Mark, I know that... Uh, Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, can we bring Mark back in again? He keeps slipping out of the spotlight and into the audience. Um, there's Mark's back in again. Yes, sorry, I, I knocked myself out that time. So did you? Sure. Okay. I, well, well, it's not something that I've given massive thought to, but I had outlined the scenario, and, and it is referred to there from a couple of the consultees or those that have responded to the consultation, where you have a town or a village and a bar closes and the license is snaffled up by a, a supermarket or you know, some uh, retail outlet and then it's gone and there's no other license for to serve that village and uh, yeah. the, 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 there won't be another one. <laughs> so, so you're not going to have a pub in that village and I think given the recognition of the pub as a hub and I know we'll, we'll touch on that again later as well and how important the role that plays in, in some places particularly here on this island and the fabric and the and identity of places I, I don't think it's something we can afford to just let go but what the way i see it Fran, Fra, is where if there was a certain population that, that wasn't serviced or, or didn't have access to a licensed premises or, or a pub sorry within a certain radius that, that an application could be made by a, a new or perhaps even existing business like it could be a restaurant there that you know could, could be look at expanding or whatever that that they might be able to apply and that there might be a certain number uh, or threshold per year that the department might might be able to grant I'm, I'm not sure I haven't given it massive thought nor would it be qualified to design the scheme itself but I do think it's certainly worth Explore. Right, thank you, Mark. It's, it's certainly an interesting uh, proposal. A proposal. Yeah. Any other members want to make any comment then around the um, surrender principle? Before I, um, Kelly has dropped out. Can we bring Kelly back into the spotlight as well, please? There we are, Kelly. You're back in again. Kelly, do you have anything you want to comment on this? I was just going to say, hopefully you can hear me, because 
Starleaf just kicked me out completely, but uh, hopefully I'm back in now. Um, so apologies if, if Mark said this in the in the minute or so when I dropped out. Um, the surrender principle, as we know, um, there has been discussion about the cost of the licences. Um, I think it's worthwhile just with the department just confirming that the statutory cost of the licence or the cost through the courts is fixed. Um, it's only when that um, private negotiation goes on that the costs then ramp up um, and that's because of the limited number. We've certainly seen from health people saying, you know, having the surrender principle is a great thing for Northern Ireland because then we don't have proliferation of pubs um, and places where alcohol can be sold across Northern Ireland. However, when we've been asking for lists of license holders, um, we've been dismissed quite a bit, you know, by saying you need to go to the, the courts and get the list yourselves. I find that completely astonishing. Um, and as Mark has said, um, how do we rural proof to ensure the pub as the hub um, can be supported if we don't have a centralised list? Um, we very carefully got a, um, maps through um, from our own RAISE you know, library, um, and thank you very much for those. Um, very useful to see that, and you can see concentrations of bars and areas um, where people go to have a night out. Um, and then, you, of course, then you see other areas where there isn't the opportunity for people to go or the nighttime economy to de be developed in other rural towns and villages because there just aren't licences there. Um, can I just ask why the department will not keep a list of licences? You know, should there not be some way as, as part of the surrender principle that we can see where these licences are, where they're going? And um, it comes back to another point um, about the changes of directorship. You know, I appreciate that the courts are involved and rightly so in this, yeah. but surely there should be some central connection for this. Plus, um, if if we are minded at some stage to go forward with um, any amendments, say, for instance, to add a local producer's license or any other types of license to this, um, I'd be expecting them to be listed as well uh, with criteria. I'm just wondering why we can't under the surrender principle, hold a centralised list within government. I do have concerns over the enforcement um, and, and how we can manage that if we don't have a centralised list. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Suzanne or Carl, do you want to make any comment on any of those points? Yeah, Chair. So the, di the difficulty with this, and it, ha it has raised its head obviously a number of times, and I believe the committee has written to the department um, and should have received a response from us. Um, the, the courts are the ones that issue the licenses, so the courts are the ones that have the legal power to ask for all of that information. For us, I mean, we've at, we have asked for an opinion on this, and the, we, we have, it's been confirmed that GDPR legislation, the GDPR regulations would come into play. Um, there is absolutely no reason for us to hold that information as we are not involved in issuing the licenses. So although the courts hold, the, the courts who do, do hold the relevant information, um, unfortunately, they don't hold it electronically. I believe Belfast is the only one that holds it electronically and at that it's an outdated system. Um, Can the... I just check, why is GDPR um, relevant here? Because you're talking about companies, you're not talking about individuals. Now the directors may well be individuals, but they are registered venues. So I'm not 100% certain how GDPR can be used in this case. Um, HMRC can give a list through Companies House of people who are registered companies. Why can we not have a list just of, of licensed people? You know, it's published by courts. Why can it not just be collected? I, I really genuinely would love to know how GDPR comes into this because that's about the protection of data on individuals, not on companies. Well, my understanding is, and the way it was explained to me, is that, I mean, these are individuals who have applied for liquor license holders, yes, or who have applied for liquor licenses. The courts do hold the information and we can access the information. Mm -hmm. um, under GDPR, you're also talking about duplication of information um, as well. So that would be the information is already held and that would amount to duplication of information if the department then collected that information. As I say, the, each, 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 each district court holds the information and they do hold it in, um, in a manual and paper format. So again, they, they, the raise, yes, raise use would have gone through the courts um, to get that information. The issue arose as well as part of, um, as part of the, the COVID financial support that was available. 
um, and uh, the rates the department had to contact, DFE had to contact the courts as well to get that information. So the information is there. There just seems to be a difficulty in accessing it due to how it is held. Um, so, you know, the, the, there, there is a piece of work that needs to be done there in terms of accessibility. Okay, members. Okay, can we move on from that? All right, we're moving on to number eight, which is levy. Um, members, the potential for a levy raised um, from the nighttime economy was discussed last week. We have noted that it works well in some cities and supports the delivery of the emergency services, etc. But in context of sector recovery from COVID, it may be difficult at this time. I know we did speak about it last week to maybe look at it, um, sort of that post-COVID um, era. Um, just then to ask, ask members any further comments or questions that you want to ask the department on this? Are we happy enough with the responses we got last week? Yeah? Sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Listen, I, I just I just feel like if we're talking about any levy on the, on the industry that it should be funneled um, to support uh, people with uh, you know alcohol addiction and, f and funneled into supporting services rather than supplementing you know, for example, you know, PSNI wages or, or, or any other plans there might be for it. I think, um, you know, I don't know if a levy is the best. I'm not saying I support a levy. I'm just saying if, if we're, we're talking about a levy, it should be, um, it should be to, to uh, support services, increase services, and it should be funneled to help people struggling with uh, alcohol addiction. Yeah, I suppose, Sinead, that's similar then to the levy um, that, that that is applied to when it comes to gambling. Um, so something similar to that, that actually that money goes to help people who have a problem um, yeah, with their addiction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any other comment on levy? I know we did discuss this last week at some length. Um, members happy to move on? Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go to number nine then, which is off-licence. Um, members, there are a number of comments and our evidence regarding the prevalence of off-licences in some communities when there are not even adequate grocery shops, highlighting the need for stricter regulations to make it harder for these places to open and stricter control for their opening times, etc. Um, I, I mean, I, I think this is uh, an issue, again, the, when we talk about the rural proofing more so than anything else. Um, um, where we need to actually have these places need to be more of a hub that um, can can furnish much more than alcohol. I don't know members any comments they want to make on that around off licences. Are they happy enough? We just move on to, just to highlight the issue, Kelly. Uh, I was just going to say on the issue of an off licence. Um you know, permission for an off license. I'm just wondering how much does the department know how much evidence is taken into the antisocial behaviour in a particular area? I'm thinking, thank goodness this year we haven't seen so many problems in and around student areas in Belfast. Um but it did require an extensive police presence. But I'm just wondering um where there are areas where there have um where there have been difficulties, um is that taken into consideration? Do you know when the off license is being issued? or the license is being issued? Yes, it should be. I mean, as part of the application process, anybody that's um, making an application has to notify the local police and council. Um, so anything anything that's raised there that, that the police would be aware of, obviously something as, as, as serious as antisocial behaviour would be included in the police, and then the police have a, an opportunity to um, a, a attend a hearing of that application. Um, uh, the, the minute there is any objection, then a, cl a clerk can't grant a license. It has to go through a court hearing. Um, so the police make an objection. It goes to a court. They appear and they set out their evidence, and then that's over to a judge, a court to decide. Then I suppose the question then, following on from that, is um, then the, the, judi the judiciary. Um, I mean, I know I've had issues in my own area over the, the over the last ten years as being an MLA. And where we've had issues with uh, bars, restaurants, off licence, whatever that might be. And um, actually, the P PS and I have done a really excellent job along with councils to build up a case, to take it to court. And when it gets to court, actually nothing happens. So it doesn't. So it's supposed to just to ask you know, that question as to uh, whenever we do have these complaints, you know, how serious is it taking them when it does go to court? Because in my experience, and also as being a councillor for a number of years and sitting on council um, with various complaints coming through, about, especially around bars, um, 
quite often, what after all of that evidence gathering, it actually doesn't go anywhere anyway. Um, so I suppose it's, it's nearly needing that information, which I know will be hard to come by off courts to say how many times do they do they actually turn something down based on evidence from the from the PSNI. You don't know if you know that answer to that. I wouldn't expect you to, but um, I don't chair no. No, um, because it's all well and good having all of these things in place, but it, it also depends on, on actually are they enacted upon, you know. Okay, members, if you're happy enough, I'll move on then to number 10, which is rural proofing. Um, again, the committee was encouraged to welcome and support any change in Northern Ireland le licensing reg legislation that will inspire rural pubs to help deliver a range of additional services or activities to their communities with the pub as a hub model being highlighted to them. It was also highlighted to us that the bill does not address a fundamental flaw of current licensing that creates migration of licensed premises away from rural areas and villages um, and continue to be depleted of licensed premises with the large pub chains buying a, buying a quiet rural pub and then reusing the license in an entirely different uh, location. Mark, do you want to talk to this if you're in the are there? Oh, come on, just or really the, the point that had already made. Yeah. Uh, Chair, and it's good to see others making it. It's interesting that the hospitality also are coming from and them thinking that the answer to this is in getting support or, or, or making existing pubs sustainable, but I don't know if there's any suggestion how that's done. And, and that's, to me, not necessarily the, the solution here either because some just simply won't, were barely sustainable. And uh, after a year of being open just a handful of weeks, that they, 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 they won't be at all sustainable going forward. And you'll have older license holders and owners in, in, in rural places where you're not going to have someone looking to come in and take the business over from them. And they, they'll just see who they can sell the license to. And I'd say more often than not, it'll be a retailer as opposed to someone with an aspiration of opening a bar. No, you're quite right, Mark. Um, I suppose, is there any other comment members want to make on this issue? Or any comment that Suzanne or Carol want to make further on it? No? Kelly, Chair, sorry. I... Sorry, Kelly, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I thought it was on mute there. Uh, can I just ask then, if we're not... Well, the surrender principle is as it is. Is there any way, just from the department's point of view, of amending the surrender principle? Now, not to change the, the limited number, but to actually put a figure, a percentage on that for how many should be in each council area or whatever way it wants to be picked out, that X number of percentage um, needs to be retained within rural. Mm -hmm. is, is there some way that we can keep, you know, maintain the, because we do know that the surrender principle, because of the way it has worked out, it is quite a lot of, of license holders' pension pots. Um, and they're looking forward to being able to sell whenever the time comes their license on, get a lot of money and that's them, you know, and good luck to them. Um, but we, as Mark has said, you know, and as it's, it's there, you know, and from Hospitality Ulster that, um, you know, our rural pubs are disappearing and they're being bought up by supermarkets. Is there a way to sort of draw a line here and say, okay, then 25% or 30% or whatever need to be in rural areas, whatever the percentage may be, or that when uh, a license of type is issued, that it can't be transferred to a different, um, you know, so if it's, it's a rural pub, um, I don't know, can it, you know, can we restrict that, that it can't be sold then for um, a hotel or for a, a supermarket or whatever? Well, I think there's 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 been a lot of issues there that are a lot of a lot of suggestions that um, could potentially be done under primary legislation. Um, the issue is, I suppose, now is around timing. Um, so if it hasn't been considered before, there's an awful lot to consider. And the first thing that's just jumping into my head in this example, um, in in what Mark described, is potentially having if you've got a if you've got a town that maybe hasn't had um, a licensed premises for a certain amount of time, so for talk's sake, say a year, um, and okay, they can now apply for a pub. Um, what happens after that? You know, you could have then operators who take advantage of that and decide, oh look, I'm going to get this at the court at the court cost. So the court recovery costs. There's no market value has been attached to this. So I'm going to get it for court cost, and then I'm going to open it and run it for uh, well any amount of time, and then actually I'm going to take that back to the big city. 
um, and I, you know, and I haven't had to, to to shell out the market value that's associated with it. So, um, yes, there's potential to do those things in legislation, um, in terms of just doing it as an amendment to to this bill, um, would be something that you need to give serious consideration to. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose I mean that the, the, this all of this stuff that we're discussing here, this latter part of the meeting, it's really just for us to put it on the record for us to. You know, whenever we are um, going back into the chamber, we have to provide a report of what the committee discussed, and there will be some recommendations will come out of it. We're not necessarily saying we need to put an amendment down to any of these issues that we are discussing, um, but they are certainly issues that have have been raised um, during the evidence sessions, albeit they're very much out of out of the scope of the bill in in, in a lot of cases. Um, but I do think it's important that we do do allow that to be it to happen around them. Um, are members content with the rural proofing part or content that we move on? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay, can we move on then uh, to number 11, which is transport again? And it was mentioned earlier as well. Um, there was a number of submissions that the bill represented a missed opportunity for measures on tackling, tackling preloading on transport on the way to venues, licensing of party buses, buses and taxis. Um, we discussed these issues on a number of occasions, and many of them fall outside the remit of the bill um, and the department, as we know. Um, so, just members, um, any other comments that we, that we haven't discussed, if we want to bring up under transport at this stage, Kelly. I was just going to say, um, I had gone with my previous infrastructure hat on. Um, I'm sure they were glad to hear from me again, the policy people within DFI, and had asked them um, about this issue. And I, I appreciate it falls out of, um, for the department's point of view, it is a DFI issue. Just to, just to say on record that we did get a response from um, the operators there, there's it basically says in terms of bus operators, Section 7 of the Transport Act 1967 gives the department the powers to attach, attach conditions to an operator's license. Um, at the moment, the conditions um, that are currently there is they must, the holder of the license, the bus operator, must take all reasonable steps to prevent the consumption um, on a bus, um, not to do anything to promote or assist in the consumption of alcohol in the bus. Um, when undertaking work for third parties, that would be like a hotel or something that's putting on the transport. Um, the license holder must ensure that the third party is aware of the law in relation to alcohol on buses and don't allow that to happen. Um, and they have to display signs in a prominent position. But the difficulty is, how does a driver look behind him when he's, or he or she when they're driving? You know, the eyes in the back of their head to see if anybody's drinking on the bus while they're driving. Um, so there does appear to be something... Um, in DFI, but it, it, it you know, the, apart from fines or, or, or looking at an operator's license, there's nothing more there, uh, which doesn't really deal with the party bus issue. Um, so I'm just wondering, maybe in our report chair, if that might be something that we might recommend an update. Yeah, we certainly can. I mean, we can make recommendations to other departments as well in our in our, our final report as well. Um, that that uh, that these issues have arisen and they you know they need to be actioned upon. So that certainly is doable. Um, I don't know if Suzanne or Carl have anything further. I know we discussed it earlier in the meeting. Anything further to add on on the issue around transport? Nothing really further, Chair. No, I mean it, there there have been very. Um, public issues um, where difficulties have arisen, particularly with young people and, and the preloading um, and the party buses. But as I say, it's not something that, that the department um, can get involved in that has, that has any control over. So DFI, um, as Kelly said, is, is the route for that one. Okay, no problem. All right, members are happy enough. Then we move on to the final um, item then, which is number 12, which is advertising. Um, members, a num uh, number of the public health submissions highlighted to us that al alcohol product packaging is everywhere and that any further steps that could be taken to minimise this would be welcome and that if looked at from a health perspective, all alcohol advertising should be banned. Again, we've discussed advertising as we've gone along and we know that much of the advertising falls outside the scope of this bill or even the remit of the department, or even the, the assembly in general. Some of it is Westminster-based. Um, so again, just on the round of advertising, can I ask members if they have any comments or questions that they want to raise on this? 
issue? Are they happy enough then that, I mean, we understand and we um, certainly know from evidence sessions and even our evidence session with our young people as well when it came to advertising, um, they very much brought this up as well, that there maybe needs to be um, more of a, a health perspective on whether that's the PHA or whether that's a campaign that should be run um, because uh, there, there, there was quite surprising during that evidence session where they had said the amount of young people now that don't smoke following the various public health campaigns around smoking and yet they, they, they couldn't actually see was there any public health campaigns that had been run uh, either nationally or, or, or through PHA um, on, um, on, on alcohol, on the misuse of alcohol. Um, so that is maybe something that we want to put through in our report as well, that maybe we would encourage the PHA to do something along those lines. Kelly? I was just going to say, we heard some fantastic evidence that came through, in particular from the sporting organisations, where they have taken almost, well, a voluntary position where um, they don't allow advertisement of any alcohol in any relation to youth teams. Um, and, and that's very welcome. I think that there is actually quite a lot of good work that's happening out there that, that their lights are being hidden under a bushel and that they don't, that that's, this sort of help is going on. Um, so we all certainly know whenever there was a ban on alcohol or sorry, tobacco sales, that it, it did have a huge difference. Um, I, I'm very torn on this one and, and, and I'm sure the department has more evidence um, why the position put forward in the current bill. There's limitations. Why was there not an all out ban on alcohol advertising proposed? The department doesn't have the power to do that, um, Kelly. Sorry, well, through the chair, the, 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 the department's remit ends at licensed premises. So it's the physical premises and the immediate vicinity around that. Um, anything above and beyond that, yes, you're talking about the PHA and the Department of Health. You're also talking about the Advertising Standards Authority and Ofcom. So, you know, in terms of your, your television and... Um, and, uh, and radio, that's more about where there's... there's um, concerns around the advertising rather than actually running an advertising campaign but if there was concerns around a particular advert then the ASA can refer to Ofcom and Ofcom can ultimately um, require that advertisement to be removed um, but in terms of actually running campaigns that would be over to the Department of Health. No that clears that up, no that's brilliant thank you. Yeah so I think that is something definitely we want to put in the report I think it was a Sinead will confirm it was the GAA had committed um, to removing all alcohol sponsorship from their, their under 18s team with a move to put it right across, isn't that correct, Sinead? That's right, that's right, Chair. Um, they're working very hard on that, but I think just on, on Kelly's point as well, like uh, maybe in our report, because it, it is beyond our remit, um, because I know, and Chair, you will know this as well through the um, <clears throat> the issues we've been looking at in terms of problem gambling, um, but you know, even again, we're, I feel a bit helpless here because it, it's, it's not. Not, we can't put it into this bill, it's not not this department's responsibility, but um, even in our report, if we can include something around um, the watershed and not, you know, that alcohol uh, products aren't advertised before the watershed or, you know, something to that effect, but I'm, I'm sure we can tease it out as we, as we go on in these deliberations. Grant, thank you, Sinead. Okay, members, anything further they want to ask before the department leave us? Any burning questions they have for Suzanne or Carol before we say cheerio to them? Nope. There you are. Okay. But can thank I then can I thank um, Suzanne and Carol for your time today? Um, I thank you very much, and um, we'll we'll see you next week and the week after and the week after that maybe as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Thank you, Chair. All Thanks right. very much, Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Okay, members, just to remind you, we're going to move into closed session very shortly. But before I do closed session, I want to go to agenda item fourteen which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Can I just advise you that our next meeting will take place um, next Thursday, the 25th of March at 9.15am in room 29. So members, please stay on the line. I'm going to finish the meeting and we're going to go into closed session. This is the...